regular town council meeting. The first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Can we have the roll call, please? Chairman Lynch? Present. Councilor Backer? Here. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Moles? Here. Councilor Roberts? Present. Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. Student Representative Skylar Armstrong? Student Representative Brianne Flynn? Here. Manager McGovern? Here. Okay, the next item on the agenda is reports and correspondence. Is there, uh, Councilor Roberts? Thank you. Um, Sadly, I was fortunate to be able to go to the fire department's 50th anniversary uh, lobster stew dinner. Uh, they've got people who have been going to that, I guess, for close to 40 or 50 years. It was sold out again this year. Firefighters do a tremendous job putting that on, and obviously all the volunteers serve this community well, so I just want to also recognize them for the 50 years on that dinner. And Councilor McGinty, I'll put a word in for him. He was over there working it while I was enjoying the food. <laughs> Some of us tried to enjoy the food, but as you mentioned, it was sold out and we were unable to get tickets, but it's a great event. You have to know somebody to get tickets. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> there are other reports and correspondence? Councillor swift -Kayada. Um I just wanted to mention um, as finance chair that budget season is upon us. It's going to be a very difficult uh, budget. We're looking at some, some big increases potentially, and I would like to let everybody know that we will be televising all of our finance committee meetings. The first one is on April 1st, and as always, but perhaps even more this year than ever, we would welcome citizen um, input on what sorts of uh, services they feel, and programs they feel are necessary or not so necessary, and what sort of tax increases they feel are acceptable or not so acceptable. And do you have all of the dates? In, um, if you I do. do. We might yeah. just mention yeah. all of the, the dates. The budget book. Um, the uh, first one, as I mentioned, is April 1st. The second one is April 5th. Then there's another one on April 6th. That one will cover the community services budget. The first two are on municipal budget. Um, April 14th is a review of the school budget. And then there's a swing day, April 28th, for catching up if we need to catch up on various departments. May 10th is when we'll have a public hearing and budget adoption. And all the meetings will be at 7.30 p.m. in the council chamber. And as I said, they will be televised, but people are welcome to come and, and attend. Just so that people know, all finance committee meetings have been, as always, public meetings. Um, where people could come and um, find out what was going on. But this year we thought it w in light of some of the tax reform issues that are coming up and the budget issues that we're facing, that it would be wise to have them televised so that people at home could be very aware of what was going on. So. Thank you, Ann. Are there any other reports? I know, Jackie, you have something to mention. I just wanted to remind the residents that we still have nomination papers that are available for the town council and school board appointments um, election. The deadline is Friday, March 19th to return them to my office. The municipal election will be held on Tuesday, May 4th. Thank you. Seeing no other reports and correspondence, we'll turn to the town manager for his report. I I'll pass on my report this evening. I know you have a lot on your agenda. So. Thank you. Okay. Next item on our agenda are the minutes from the February 9, 2004 meeting. I have a motion. I move the adoption of the minutes. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Three, four, five, six, seven, zero. The next item on our agenda is um, time for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda. So if you are here for an item that is on the agenda, we will have time to hear from you in a little while. But if you are here to raise any other issue with the council that's not on the agenda, uh, this is a time for you to do that. And we also have a time at the end of our council meeting as well. So if there's anyone who'd like to 
bring something to the council's agenda. Okay, seeing none, we will move to the next item, which is approval of the town manager's appointment. This is item 104. Approval of the town manager's appointment of Deborah Cabana as town clerk of Cape Elizabeth, effective March 29, 2004. And Deborah's resume is in your package. She's extremely hot, well qualified. I think we feel very fortunate to have her. I don't know, Michael, if you want to say anything else. Yes, I would like to say a few words. First of all, before we move to the uh, hope, the hopeful approval of the new clerk, I'd like to thank uh, Jackie Coy once again, who has served very ably as our as our town clerk, uh, running elections and helping out in my office and and doing so much of keeping all our, our vital statistics up to date. And I know everyone joins me in thanking Jackie for her efforts. Second, I'd ask, like to ask Deborah Lane to come. Deborah Lane to come forward. We we seem to have a uh, a plethora surplus of, of a plethora. <laughs> yes, a plethora of Deborahs, but also a, a plethora of clerks this evening. And I'd ask that if she could introduce a couple of special guests we have with us this evening. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening, councilors. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Deborah Cabana and some folks that have come out to support her this evening. Deborah, if you want to. Stand up so everybody can see. This is Deborah Cabana. She is the manager's recommendation for our new town clerk. Beside her is her husband, Rick, Rick Cabana. Beside him is Rita Bernier. Rita is Deb's mom, and she is also the former town clerk of Wyndham and still continues uh, working part time for the town of Wyndham. Uh, in back to the far left is Kathy Montejo. Kathy is the city clerk in Lewiston. Thanks for coming down tonight, Kath. Uh, next to her is Linda Cohen. Linda Cohen currently serves as a city clerk in the city of Portland. Nice to see you again, Linda. Um, also with us this evening is Carrie Olson and Debbie Bump. They both serve in the tax office and will be working alongside uh, Deb, assume that she is confirmed this evening. Thank you, ladies. I know it's been a long day, so we appreciate you coming out. So um, again, we thought it was important to introduce Deb and some of her family and supporters. Um, at this time, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Just a, a couple more words about uh, Deborah Cabana. Uh, she came to us as a result of an interview, advertising uh, widely and an interview process. Uh, she's served since the year 2000 in charge of all of the elections in the state of Maine, as well as all the referenda uh, that have come before us as voters. Uh, that includes uh, looking at all the nominating petitions uh, statewide as well as conducting the November 2000 election and the election subsequent to that. She also before that served as the uh, city clerk for the city of Saco and as the town clerk for the town of Brunswick. Uh, she is uh, definitely, she had other things too I could go on for, for some time, but we're extremely fortunate uh, to have her uh, be willing to serve as, uh, as the town clerk of Cape Elizabeth, and uh, I very, very uh, strongly recommend uh, her approval this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Do I have a motion? <coughs> Councilor Mould. Yes. I move that we approve the town manager's appointment of Deborah S. Cabana as town clerk of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, effective March 29, 2004. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Michael. I promise you, Deborah, most of the town council meetings you will attend will not be as um, well attended. As well attended. Not that we don't encourage this, it's really a wonderful thing, but most of the time we're here by our lonesome, so it's actually great to see all of you tonight. And, but I didn't want Deborah to go away thinking our town council meetings are like Portland City Council meetings. So. <laughs> okay. Everyone watches from home. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, the next item is the item I think most of you are here for, and that is the public hearing on issues related to cellular coverage and public safety communications and action on a recommendation for a proposed tower overlay district in the area of Route 77 
near Sprague Hall. I'd like to just, uh, before we open the public hearing, I'd like to have Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, come up and give us all a little history of the process and a description of what is before us before we get into a discussion. I think it's important that we're all singing from the same sheet of music, at least in terms of what's happened before and how we got to where we are today. So I'll have Maureen do that. Then we'll open it up to a public hearing. Our, our council rules, we have a three minute uh, limit on um, public testimony. That's not because we don't want to hear from you, but because we want to hear from as many of you as we can. Um, we can extend that, um, if, particularly if, you, if you're providing new information, but I'd ask you um, to be um, brief and succinct and try and cover all of your points and, and we'll make sure that everyone who is here to speak has an opportunity to speak. So with that, Maureen, I'd ask you to give us a little history. Sure, and I'm gonna back up one more step than you asked. Um, in the town of Cape Elizabeth, it's a little different than the way other towns regulate towers. In other communities, it's very common to make towers a conditional or special exception or permitted use in business and industrial zones. Well, in Cape Elizabeth, we have no industrial zones and our area devoted to commercial zones are, is extremely limited. It's highly unlikely we would ever be able to accommodate towers in that small area. So the other option was to open up uh, a residential zone to towers, and that seemed way too much in the other direction in terms of allowing the, the construction of towers. So we've created something called a tower overlay district. Uh, there are two places in town that currently have tower overlay districts. One is on Strout Road, off of Spurwink Ave, and there are two principal cell towers there plus several other smaller ones. The other tower overlay district is located at the transfer station site, and there are no commercial towers there at this time. Uh, what happened at the end of last year was that a representative from U.S. Cellular approached the town requesting to zone another part of town as a tower overlay district with the intention of constructing a commercial tower in that area if the zone change was granted. Uh, so it was referred to the council and they sent it to the planning board. The planning board held a workshop on not just the potential for a tower on the Sprague land, but also a more general topic of cell phone communications, including the area of Fort Williams and issues about wireless and public safety communications throughout the town. Uh, and what I'm going to do is send around the three uh, notices that I have so you can see the evolution of the, the public uh, notice portion of this. But at the workshop, the original notice was sent out for this area right over here, which is basically behind the Sprague Hall. And at the workshop, the uh, applicant said that they were looking at this area, but they were starting to think about maybe moving over here instead. And one of the reasons was that um, all of the land south of Bowery Beach Road can only be leased for up to one year at a time. And that was not acceptable to the cell phone company. So they were looking at the land north of Bowery Beach Road instead. And they were looking at that with the private property owner, which happens to be the Spray Corporation. The planning board looked at that issue, uh, looked at the coverage, and I'm hoping that uh, the company will come forward with some of the information the planning board used to come up with their decision. They scheduled a public hearing on this in January, and another notice was sent out. The map changed to include a lot more of this area because the whole thing was evolving. At the public hearing, uh, the planning board heard from the applicant mm -hmm. again, and the applicant said that this was really the area they were interested in, and they had actually done their studies of this area. And there was even a member of the public who lives in this neighborhood who came out and wrote a letter saying that this is the area they would prefer to have the tower. So. The recommendation from the planning board was to locate the tower in this area in the tree line of off of Bowery Beach Road so that the base of the tower could be pushed back into the tree line. Obviously the upper part of the tower is going to be visible, but at least the base would have uh, some, some buffering. Uh, and then the council uh, held some meetings on this, and the final uh, map that was sent out for this night's meeting looks just like this. It was based on a location described by the applicant's representative where they have, and I'm gonna let him describe how we got to this point, but what was described to me was that we weren't going to be putting the tower in the tree line as the planning board recommended. 
because if we did that, there were some places here where the base of the tower was very visible to the, the residents of Fowler Road. So there was an effort made to find a place that wasn't as quite as visible to the residents of Fowler Road. The downside is it pushes it out of the tree line. It's very visible from Bowery Beach Road. I informed the applicant that it was my expectation that if they proceeded forward and came through site plan review, that the planning board would be requiring a heavy amount of landscaping to buffer that uh, base since he wasn't being able to take advantage of the existing tree line and he said he understood that. So where we are in the process is the planning board has made a recommendation. It's before the council tonight. If the council agrees to rezone this area, it would create an overlay district in which a tower could be constructed. But before the tower could be constructed, the applicant would be required to come back to the planning board for site plan review. And the board would be reviewing the tower under the tower overlay district requirements that include things like uh, the 125% setback, uh, buffering, uh, lighting, that there would not be any, uh, and those types of issues. So I'm just going to send around uh, these three maps, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, okay there are questions of Maureen. Jack, you have one. Yes, Maureen, I have one uh, was brought to my attention today, and I hadn't picked up on it earlier, but on page eight, uh, 17 and 18 of the comprehensive plan, that area is identified as a rural protection area. Can you explain what a rural protection area is and whether or not this is, is uh, consistent with that? Well, the, a rural protection area is the opposite of a growth area. So it's not an area where we actively promote growth. However, uh, when we adopted the Tower Overlay District regulations, I believe it was in 1999, John, you're going to correct me on that. Uh, we actually also adopted an amendment to the comprehensive plan that explicitly talked about allowing the construction of towers with the principles that we limit the construction as much as possible or re require co-location, those types of goals. So in my opinion, the existing tower overlay district is consistent with the comprehensive plan with that amendment. Okay. Are there other questions of Maureen right now? Maureen, will you be here for the duration of this hearing? Okay, then if there are other questions, we might call you back. Okay, at this point, I will open up the public hearing. Um, I'd ask you to come up to the podium, use the microphone, and please give us your name and address. <coughs> Good evening and thank you, counselors, leaders, members of the community, neighbors, and guests. My name is Eleanor Guare. I live at 301 Fowler Road with my husband, Tom. And I was asked by Susan Long to come here tonight and provide a summary of some of the points of opposition held by over 100 people who signed a petition that Susan and others have diligently sent around over the next last few days. And I believe, Susan, you have copies of that if people want to see it. I understand that these views, while they may be held by many, are not held by all. And I'm also aware that there may be additional points, in addition to those that we've compiled here, that people may want to bring up. So I'll let this be brief and give others the opportunity to speak. I'd like to call your attention to the handout that you received coming in, which is a bulleted list of items and some maps attached. And what I'd like to do is just read through some of these points. Are these handouts available to you? They are all, uh, I, believe, I believe you're probably referring to this one? Yes, it, it says key oppositions to the proposed cell phone tower. Right? This one, That's it. okay, this is in front of all of us. So I can step through them really quickly and then maybe we could hold comments until after I'm through and then open it up to anybody else who have other things to say, I'm sure. Um, we have really placed the issues of preservation and the natural beauty and character of our town at the foremost of our concern. Uh, the proposed site is documented as Councillor Roberts has indicated um, in the Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan as a scenic view as well as an area of rural protection. So that covers the first two points on that handout. 
We are committed to the protection of rural character and the natural beauty of our town. Visitors to our town and beaches would be greeted by a visually unattractive and really truly offensive 150 foot metal structure rather than the quaintness that they now receive with a beautiful hand carved sign and the burrowing church and historic rain hall and then the sweeping farmland and the vistas to the ocean. So they would be greeted by that coming and going to some of the few sandy beaches that are available in this part of the state. Our town also makes a conscientious effort to prevent unsuitable businesses and buildings from locating here. There's a lot of talk about not bringing in companies and businesses that are unattractive. So we feel this is no exception. The amount of cell phone coverage as we understand it would result that the, that the tower would result from is doesn't appear to affect some of the concerned coverage areas at all. So it really wouldn't solve the problem 100%. Um, and, and it does nothing to support the majority of residents in the proposed location. We have great cell phone coverage, both in our homes and in our cars, in the area around Fowler Road and off of Fowler Road. We must consider the environment, environmental impact of the potential tower construction. The proposed site is also listed in the comprehensive plan as one of only two deer wintering areas in Cape Elizabeth. Now, I'll be the first to say, as my neighbors know, that I have mixed feelings around the deer wintering in that particular area. Uh, and there was times where I wished that they would winter elsewhere. However, it's not just the deer, but the whole natural habitat and everything surrounding that that would be impacted. And lastly, um, the area, as everybody knows, is frequented by numerous sports and fitness enthusiasts. Ask Frank. Um, he's our daily jogger um, in that area, and people walk that road every day. People come park their cars at the grain hall so they can walk that beautiful road. And think about the competitive athletes that come from all over the world to stand just at that, that line to start the Beach to Beacon, and they would be greeted by the 150 foot cell phone tower. So, um, those are the points that I would like to make, and the map um, attached here really do indicate the, the points of scenic view and rural preservation and environmental protection. So we hope that you will consider to hear our voices tonight. And thank you very much. Thank you. I think my front lawn must be the other deer wintering <laughs> area. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Seth Sprague, and I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the Sprague Corporation, which is the owner of the land being considered for designation as a tower overlay district. And I'd like to explain a little bit about uh, the background of our involvement in, in this issue. Uh, we were approached in, uh, in December of last year by LCC International, uh, an agent for uh, U.S. Cellular, find out whether we would talk to them about placing a cell tower on our property. Uh, they wanted to improve cell phone coverage in Southern Cape Elizabeth, which uh, in our experience is poor. Uh, initially though, we didn't, we didn't have much interest in that. The mission of the Sprague Corporation is to uh, conserve our property for agricultural, recreational, and and residential use by our family and a cell tower doesn't really fit the bill for that and uh, it's unsightly to boot. However, the company rather quickly was able to get our attention. Uh, first, they cited that uh, the interest of the town administration and public safety officials in addressing shortcomings in the town's fire and police communications through placement of antennae on a tower. Uh, the town manager was able to confirm that for me and that, that interest for me and, and we have since heard uh, from both the police chief and the fire chief uh, about the importance of this uh, public safety issue. Second, uh, we were shown a map created by LCC with an outline and with an area outlined that they described as the zone 
uh, within which they'd like to place a tower. And it was based on studies that they'd done about uh, where to place a tower to best create cell phone coverage uh, in the southern part of the Cape. About 95% of that area was uh, on our property. Um, it, uh, it ran on either side of Route 77 from the Sperling Church uh, down 77 to the crest of the hill near where the uh, Beach to Beacon race starts. Um, and it became clear to us that if we simply said no, we weren't going to talk to them about it, um, it, was, it was likely that there was going to be no tower. And we didn't want to be viewed as arbitrarily uh, obstructions in the face of what was being described as a, as a real community need. Uh, and finally, uh, we were offered a financial inducement in the form of rent for the land on which they wanted to place the tower. Our use of our property has remained largely unchanged in the 100 years that, that we've been here. Um, yet our property taxes uh, increased a whopping 45% uh, this year as a result of the revaluation. And we're told now that we're going to expect another 12.5% increase in our property taxes next year. Uh, like most taxpayers, our capacity to absorb such increases is not as great as the ability of the taxing authorities to create the increases. Thus, opportunities to earn income to offset this financial burden become increasingly important. If we can't pay these huge increases in our taxes, we can't conserve our property. Concerning the precise location of the, of the tower on our property, uh, there are long-standing family agreements concerning the use of our property that limit this type of project to the north side of the Great Pond side of Route 77. Uh, a suge another suggested location in the woods on the ridge uh, leading into Great Pond, uh, we, we rejected because this is the, the main access point that we have into Great Pond. And uh, a tower in that location would have uh, greatly uh, inhibited any future potential use that we could have made of that, that whole Great Pond parcel. Uh, so this left us with trying to tuck the tower over onto the edge of the property uh, on the Fowler Road side. Uh, again, thinking we're trying to stay within the zone that, uh, uh, that was feasible for the erection of a, a tower. Uh, and we, we walked up and down the length of that property there, and, and we tried to settle on a spot that seemed to provide the, the best protection for the houses along Fowler Road. Any view of the base of the tower will be fairly well shielded. Um, in the winter months from Fowler Road homes, and I think very well shielded when the leaves are out, uh, at least the base of the tower. Uh, the site, however, as Maureen said, will be visible from cars traveling south along Route 77 from Crescent Beach towards the, the church. Uh, it'll be possible to minimize the view of the tower base somewhat with plantings, uh, but. Um, there's no question that it will be visible. Um, and the mass of the tower will be almost entirely visible from the driveway of a home on Route 77 uh, at the corner of Charles Jordan across from the Grange Hall, which happens to be owned by my sister, Kate Gilbane, uh, who uh, is, is supportive of the tower proposal. Uh, I hope that over time, the loom of the tower will fade, but for us, uh, a combination of a sense of civic responsibility and, and frankly the financial contribution available that will help us preserve our land into the future 
uh, has led us to offer this, this property for uh, consideration as a tower overlay district. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others who are here to speak on this issue? Excuse me, I, uh, Chairman Lynch. I, I wonder if it would be helpful if someone is planning on speaking on from the from LCC, um, if it would be helpful for them to provide the background. They're certainly welcome to. It, it is a public hearing now, and they have addressed the council at the last meeting and at a workshop. So I w would look to them keeping their remarks to about three minutes unless counselors have specific questions that they want to ask so um, but they're certainly welcome to speak as anyone else who is here is welcome thank you um, i'm heidi hansen i live at 313 bella road with my husband bruce um, first of all i'd like to thank seth for coming up and explaining the um, background and the motivations and all that for the straight corporation to consider this property um, I'd also like to second all the points on this handout and particularly highlight the fact that we do have four bars out in, on Fowler Road. We don't have, need better cell coverage and that's at least on that part of the Southern Cape. Um, the second thing that I'd just like to address is the public safety issue. <clears throat> I think that there probably uh, undoubtedly is for coverage um, for the police, fire, and wet teams over on the south part of the Cape. However, my problem with this bringing up this civic responsibility and public safety issue is that the public safety people didn't bring it up first, the cell tower people did. And I think that we need to really consider that and think about other options maybe to solve the problems for the uh, public safety people other than a, a cell tower. Thanks. Thank you. Are there others who are here to speak? You, you might just form a little bit of a line that would um, keep this moving. Great, thank you. Well, Paul Woods, Broad Cove area. Um, I came in a little bit late um, in the middle of Maureen's comments, um, um, and I heard Mr. Sprague talk about um, um, the, the issues surrounding um, the placement of the tower on, on their property, and I've never met Mr. Sprague. I don't think I would um, recognize Sprague by bumping into the IGA. I really wouldn't, but it was very compelling to hear, very compelling to hear the, the candor in terms of, look, there's a financial aspect to this, citing the tower by following roads in their property. There also is a, um, um, a, civic, uh, a, a civic component to that. Uh, it's a blend of both. And I think that cell phone service in this town has been and will continue to be a vital service. Citing these towers is always contentious. There are people um, in, in every community throughout this land when it comes to citing towers. It's a, it's a push. It's a pull. It's a give and a take. At the end of the day, though, I do not think going forward in the years to come, cell phone coverage for the entire town is an option. I think it is a vital necessity. When you put on top of that the public safety issues, fire and police, yeah, okay, so people say, well, yeah, well, they didn't talk about it before the cell phone companies came and all this. Well, I understand that, too, but make no mistake about it, with it all going up early, if something did happen where coverage was not available to a particular point in this town and something unfortunate happened public safety wise it would become a front burner issue for the entire town and i think the momentum would be very very strong to place towers improve communications let's not get to that point this wireless debate i think is very similar to where electricity was seven years ago you need do people need electricity? Well, maybe not 24 hours a day, maybe just 12 hours a day. There's all kinds of range. Do you need wired, wireless service wherever you are? Well, the need can be debated, but I think going forward, it is something that will increasingly become vital. And this is changing very, very fast. I remember five years ago when this was 
brought up in terms of siting in districts. There were surveys done and there was a use sort of a, a feel for use. To my mind, it is very similar to how fast computer use goes forward. Um, computers five years ago are nothing like they are today. People's use of wireless phones are nothing like they were five years ago. They will be nothing like they are five years hence. The range of service, the evolution in that industry is moving very, very fast. Our dependency on it is, is very great. I would urge the council to approve the follow road um, overlay district. And I would also urge the council to strongly consider a tower at Fort Williams. And I know that's heresy. I know we all love Fort Williams. It's a marvelous place. But I do think at some point it's time for Fort Williams to give a little bit back to the town. And when I say that, I mean that we are all good stewards of it. We are indebted to the people in the town council, planning board, the committees that surround the Fort Williams district. They do a marvelous job of taking care of that property. They do a marvelous job of taking responsibility, showing it to the world and showing it to the citizens. We are all indebted to that type of involvement and that type of commitment. But at some point, it is not theme park. Um, it is not something to remain static. The views, the, um, uh, the, um, the very placement of things evolves. And this is a park that is in, in, in town. It provides coverage for short acres and broad cove area. Yes, I live in the Broad Cove area. But I stand before you tonight, if I did not live in the Broad Cove area, I would still support coverage to that district, even though I would not be in that area. It is vital. It is something that people will increasingly rely upon and rely upon right now. I would not want to cite in Fort Williams Park cannons 100 years ago, whenever they first um, became a, a military establishment. But I trust the town council. I trust the planning board. I trust the town manager that when it comes to the decision, they will make an intelligent and thoughtful choice as the best location to site these towers. And I think that is what is part of what makes this town very, very nice and very desirable because people do bring a lot of effort to it. And when it comes time to citing the towers, when it comes time to making those decisions, I think they'll be done thoughtfully. I trust the people doing it and I urge the council to paved the way for cell phone coverage for the entire town. Thank you. Thank you. But state your name. And uh, my name is Richard Berman. I live at 1021 Shore Road. And my understanding, I think, so far is that private business persons coming to the town wanting to get uh, put up towers to get better cell phone coverage so they can sell more cell phones and have a better business plan. It makes a lot of sense. But that's, they're coming into town. And then we have a landowner that's asking for a zone change to allow a tower. And to me, it's a, um, the public safety, it sounds like it's a spin-off. It's an added benefit to this whole thing. I would just say that no, I think Cape Elizabeth is special, and, and I think if you pull this off, it looks as special. It's, we, we love living in a community that has a rural character to it. We all give to the land trust, and if we don't, we should. We spend time on the conservation commission, and I think we do a very good job of keeping a certain character, and we're convenient to the city. You know, we have it all. But it's very fragile. And my concern, um, um, by the way, I believe in property rights, and, uh, but we have a property owner coming to the town asking for a zone change. I mean, I'd rather cut his taxes and not get zone change, quite frankly, if that's the issue. It's <laughs> so my, my real, people look at this, you the character, there's certain energy. If you go to Fort Williams, there's a certain energy certain character, certain something deeper than just visual impact. If you go to the marsh on right across from the transfer station on that town owned land that was preserved and you look across and you see these fields, it's special. By the way, if you turn too far right and see a cell tower right there, it ruins that experience. There are other special places and I, I, I feel emotional about this, but 
I got married in that church, and I belonged to the Grange Party. That corner, that area, is a very special place. I think we all feel it. That's where our cemetery is. And it's our history. And of all the places in town, that's what Cape Elizabeth used to feel like right there. And in your deliberation, I, I would really be very careful of visual impact. And to me, it'd be like, you know, if you're driving down what is it, uh, where the Shaker Village is, the rolling hill, and you're approaching where Shaker Village is, imagine a tower being right there. You would focus on driving, just as you would on this side, driving, you see it from a great distance. And you might come by and not even notice the base, but you notice you're, you're just distracted, and meanwhile, you're blowing right through history. So I think that there's magical places in town, I know that sounds crazy, and you're looking at two of them in the next two weeks. This corner, this very precious corner, and it has a quiet, historic feeling to it, and Fort William, two of the jewels of the town. And it all comes down to, is it convenience we need in town, or character, or soul? Um, by the way, I confess, I don't have a cell phone. It's, I hate to say it, but I screwed up the bridge a few years ago. <laughs> Don't, don't uh, tell EPA, but um, you know, it, it really is convenient. We have our kids, we have busy lives, we get in touch. But it also speeds up life, and I do, I do sound like I'm being old when I say these things, but I, I think there's some truth in it. By the way, I read that this business person who wants these cell phones sets up these cell phones by traffic cones, not by where people live. I don't know about you, but that's, I think we're trying to stop people using their cell phones in their cars because it's caused more accidents. And yet these things are cited that way. So Mr. Sprague's property is perfect for travel to cause accidents. I, I, so you know where I'm standing on it. And, you know, you've got a tough one ahead of you, uh, but I also have uh, faith in your good judgment. Thank you. Thank you. I'd ask you to hold the applause and we'll just go through having everyone have an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bill Fricky. I work for LCC International and I'm here on behalf of US Cellular. I wish that there were an easy answer to uh, the very valid concerns that have been expressed tonight. It's easy to say NIMBY, not in my backyard, and uh, to an extent that, that always is the case with the cell tower. But I don't say that to damn the people who do it. If you don't care for your, about your neighborhood, who will? If you don't come here and talk about a tower going up in your neighborhood and you oppose it, then shame on you. So I support the, uh, the neighbors and the townspeople and the right to come and to talk about it. And I hope to listen about why we chose that site. It wasn't a whim, and it wasn't because we wanted to spoil the beauty of that corner of town or Spurling Church. The reason is that only certain characteristics work for cellular te telephone coverage. And before I get into that, let me say that in 1996, the Telecommunications Act was enacted by Congress. And among other things, Congress said that there will be cellular telephone coverage across the United States, and it will be offered by a, a, a number of carriers competitively in each area. To that end, there were auctions, licenses were purchased by U.S. Cellular, OmniPoint, which is now T-Mobile, AT&T Wireless, uh, various other carriers. <laughs> and the result of that decision, and of those decisions in 96, um, and I started doing this work in 96, by the way, is that we, the cellular coverage in the United States went from a couple million to a hundred million. You may recall when uh, cell coverage was a dollar a minute, a dollar and a half a minute, now it's five cents a minute, free on nights and weekends, special calling rates. 
That's the result of an industry that grew according to the way that Congress and the FCC designed it in 1996. In the industry that was given incentives to go out and build networks and cover areas and, and an act that, that said that local boards can't unilaterally just say no to cell coverage in their community because I think we all know many would have, it would have inhibited the network, would have inhibited the growth of the industry, and we wouldn't have wireless communications today the way we do. Nothing comes for free. There is no free lunch. If we had invisible towers, we'd be using them. Uh, a word about towers. No carrier wants to put up a tower for a number of reasons. First, a tower costs about a quarter of a million dollars in terms of development, administration, construction, and, and uh, approval costs. For that quarter of a million dollars, all the carrier that built it gets is a stable platform to put antennas on. And generally, the obligation to lease it to its own competitors. It's not good business. If you can put a tower, if you can get cellular coverage without building a tower, and you're a cellular telephone carrier, that's what you do. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's a water tank, a steeple, a rooftop, a billboard, a smokestack available. You use it. You save yourself a quarter of a million dollars by doing so, or the better part of it. Now, the trouble is, Cape Elizabeth does not have any tall buildings, smokestacks, billboards, water tanks, or steeples in that area other than Spurling Church, and that's not very high, and it would accommodate at best perhaps one carrier. The specifics of what works for a carrier in a cell site are fourfold. It has to be, and I was taught this eight years ago, RFable, zonable, leasable, and constructible. RFable is the most important. It involves the laws of physics, and there is no exception to it. Cellular, cellular transmissions go in pretty much line of sight. They don't go much over two and a half to three miles. They get interrupted by any physical artifact like a tree line, a ridge, a hill, a valley, or a large building. The farther out they go, the weaker they are. The weaker they are, the more they get interfered with by a dip in the road or a hook around a hill or a ridge line or trees. The signals are absorbed by leaves, which are essentially little bags of water. And they absorb energy just as well as your coffee cup does in your microwave when it heats up in the morning. So you can't shoot through the trees, you can't shoot through leaves, you've got to get above them, you have to pretty much be in line of sight of what you're trying to hit. In designing the, the network, you can't put your sites more than four to five miles apart and you have to take into account the hills, the valleys, the buildings, the ridge lines, the trees, etc. This is part of a network, and it would be a mistake to look at it as only Cape Elizabeth. It has to hook into a site to the south or the southwest. It has to hook into the northeast or, and north. The Strout Lane site in Cape Elizabeth takes care of the north direction. Over towards Pleasant Hill, with, over towards Route 1, there's coverage that way. We're looking in Scarborough and haven't yet really found a place for sure, the, a home for, for what will be a tower there but it looks like it'll be over towards Black Point Road. From Black Point Road to Cape Elizabeth is, I don't know, two and a half, three miles. And if we don't have, or four miles actually, by the time you get into it, if we don't have a tower roughly there, then Route 77, as you come down and hook the left, and head over towards Higgins Beach, and then dip down to the river, and you know what I'm talking about is marshland, you're three feet above it on one side, that valley is not going to get covered by anything. Now, I know that that's, that's Scarborough, it's not Cape Elizabeth, but it's also a network design um, issue that has to be addressed by U.S. Cellular. If we put the tower where the overlay district is, we'll be covering Route 77 coming into town, we'll be covering Higgins Beach, we'll be covering the south end of town uh, at the bottom there. We'll also be covering Route 77 going along and depending on the height of the tower, and the council has seen propagations, at 180 feet we'll be covering all or substantially all of shore acres. As you go down, there's no question the signal will attenuate. As I said, it has to be line of sight. The lower it goes, the more the hill where the water tank is becomes a shadow, or the, the area behind it dipping down to the water becomes a... Becomes a 
uh, breaks the signal up and reduces the signal. Um, this is, I, I venture to say, just to put it in context, not the only tower application you're going to see. As has been mentioned, and as was mentioned at the workshop, the um, Fort Williams, north end of town, going into South Portland, very high traffic count, denser population, not good coverage. Again, a situation where there's no natural artifact or, or no large construction where, where towers can go, where um, antennas can go, probably going to need a tower. This isn't the only additional tower you're likely to see. In order to cover Cape Elizabeth, there's going to be another. If you do not site your overlay zone in a way that accommodates that RFable, zonable, constructible, leasable scenario, it won't be used. The, 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 in one of the uh, workshops, or in the workshop with the council, the question was, you know, why has Cape Elizabeth been left alone for three or four years? Why hasn't there been coverage? Why haven't you seen more applications? Four years ago, I was involved in a network design in this in, in Maine, in this area, exactly. And Cape Elizabeth wasn't high on our, our list of priorities of places to go. It's difficult zoning. It's difficult for aesthetic reasons. It's difficult for political reasons. And it doesn't have a large population or a very large traffic count. Compared with where we were building the towers, which are all the ones you see up and down the pike in 295, um, it took a back seat. Now Cape Elizabeth's time has come and will continue to come as the networks build out and go from their primary to their secondary to their tertiary sites and expand their, their footprint. But all carriers, and I've worked for four networks, four carrier networks and two tower companies. All of them are faced with those same four criteria. And I'd urge the board to consider when you, if you're not going to make this your overlay zone, I ask you, where are you going to? So far, U.S. Cellular is the only company that's had the fortitude, the, the dedication to see this process through to this point. If, and th this is where we think the tower has to go. I don't think there's any carrier behind us knocking on the door. And I'm sure people would like to applaud at that. But the point is, if you are going to have cellular coverage in Cape Elizabeth, you're going to have cell towers. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is no plan B. In three, four years of active network build out in Maine, Cape Elizabeth has been left alone. Now Cape Elizabeth is not going to be left alone. Carriers are going to be coming in. We have a mandate on the license to cover this town. We have to. We'll keep coming in, looking for the place. We think this is the place. It is not the perfect place. Every cell tower, every cell site is a compromise of those four criteria. And I understand that we are intruding into a scenically sensitive viewscape. We do have the advantage of essentially being on the inside of 77 rather than shoreward. We do have the advantage of being behind you if you're looking at Spurwing Church from the more picturesque angles. We do have the advantage that there's nothing inland from there, nearby, no housing development, no other major road that'll be looking right through the tower when you're looking out to the ocean or Casco Bay. So yes, it will intrude on a viewscape, but, and yes, it's a beautiful viewscape, but anywhere we go will intrude. If we go to Shore Acres, everybody in the Shore Acres area will certainly see that tower. Neighborhood by neighborhood, we can go through the town and see who shows up and says, I'd rather you be there, I'd rather you be somewhere else. And I understand that. We're, our position is that this works well for cellular coverage. You're going to get the maximum bang for the buck, to put it bluntly, by putting a tower here. A lot of Cape Elizabeth will be covered. Relatively good you know, location in terms of the viewscape and we don't think any other place will work nearly as well. Um, I, I could answer questions. Uh, we have our RF engineer here. We have a site acquisition fellow who talked to the various landowners and looked at the various sites. So I'd like to lay that as a groundwork about why here and not somewhere else in Cape Elizabeth. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Fritz. Are there any questions of Mr. Fritz? Or I guess I would suggest at this time the LCC representative. Are you going, well, are you going to be here? Am I going to be here? The rest of the evening? Oh, yes. Okay, I thought you would be. Well, I think what we'll do then is hold our questions and have the rest of the public speak. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who's here to speak? Good evening. My name's Bill Hewitt from 113 Fowler Road. And I did find this gentleman's comments very interesting, informative about the cellular coverage. But I guess I hope the council tonight takes a firm position against this because I do find his attitude a little overbearing on the way he presented that U.S. Cellular will be coming to us, whether it's Fowler Road, whether it's Fort Williams, et cetera. So I do think that there could have been a softer approach taken with the resident tonight, because I actually was standing there saying, well, I know it's important for coverage, civic reasons, et cetera, but listening to him, I'd rather have AT and T come to us. I'd rather have other competitors start bidding on the Sprague property than have this gentleman tell the council and the local residents that they'll be here and will continue to persist in their uh, willingness to put up towers in our town. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please let's hold the applause and it's public hearing. My name is Dennis Gallagher, and I live at 357 Fowler Road. Um, just in comparison, uh, think of the, how rapidly computers have changed within the past 10 years, and that the technology is rapidly developing. And I would imagine that the same thing is happening with communication. And in two, three, five years, what have you, we don't know. Even the people that sell these things do not know how rapidly uh, things are changing and so we are going to end up uh, building a tower in five years or so which will be obsolete so to me it's uh, very uh, similar to computers okay, a computer that is five years old is no longer really uh, useful and I think we have to consider that um, that this is a ra uh, rather rapidly developing technology and we are changing the environment for something that may be obsolete in a few years thank you Thank you. Now, I, th I think we'll hold on the um, company comments until the public has um, provided us with other comments. Are you a resident? I'm sorry, I've been corrected. No, the other gentleman is both resident and the other Are you a resident? I, I'm, I apologize then. <laughs> a twofer. You were a twofer. <laughs> Uh, my name is Prakash Suman. I live on 89 Sarbo Drive. I moved here last year uh, in the summer uh, because I work for uh, LCC International and I was on this project to uh, design the network of three counties, uh, Kamon, York, and Sagarahat. And uh, I've, been design I've been working on Cape Elizabeth uh, for almost a uh, year, design-wise. And, and I, I think the location which I chose over the time, I, I've, uh, I've analyzed the whole Cape Elizabeth area and we did provide the study to uh, Cape Elizabeth, town of Cape Elizabeth. And I, I do want to tell one thing is that I, I based my study on uh, South Colton Tower, which is the same characteristics area as here it is. We did try test that site with the test transmitter, find out whether the model I created for the area was accurate or not, and based on that, we generate the plot, and this has a very good accuracy of showing you statistically what the prediction of the coverage is, and the cover and the uh, and try to look at we we try to use those all the existing structures, and we used all the existing structures we had, and we did provide the plot showing what is the current CCS coverage we do have in the town. And, and 
but after looking at the area in all directions, including shore acres uh, and port volumes and, and the southern part of the uh, Cape Elizabeth. And I, I myself go many times in the beach area, and I don't have service there. And like, like many people, some of the people did say there that they do have the services. They probably do in uh, Paula, on the Paula Road, maybe, and but they don't have coverage in the areas where most of the vis visitors go. And when I ran the analysis to most of the area, I think the area which we have chosen here tonight, we are discussing the area. This area will provide the maximum possible coverage in town of Cape Elizabeth and in a very small portion of Fort Bowling area will not be having coverage as of today if we did get this tower. And that will cover most of the area of Cape Elizabeth. And another thing which I noticed was that uh, a person, a gentleman did say that in five years this could be an obsolete technology. I probably don't know today in five years how much this thing could be developed, but the network which we are building, I do want our people to know that it's called a third generation network. We do have data service with the phone and with the phone which uh, with the phone we use with this technology and Verizon right now do provide that kind of services and they do not have services in that in the southern part of the table is it. And 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 the technology is moving in the direction where you're going to get higher speed of data, and this tower will do support that kind of service, will support that kind of service. And another thing is that there are a lot of uh, statements or, uh, or the uh, concerns regarding the uh, visitors to our town and beaches would be here, would be here to a visually unattractive uh, and offensive 150 feet tower rather than a quaint white church. And I think they also have to consider that those visitors will not be able to make phone calls when they are when there's an emergency or they may be on holidays and they could be in trouble too and they won't they won't have services. Now I don't know how many people do agree with this with this point, but what I understand every individual has a right to have solar service no matter where they are. If some of the people in Cape Elizabeth do have services, then I, I don't. I, w I think that every person has a right to have solar service, and if there are certain areas which are not served, and there are people who are having problems, town has to understand that not all people probably use cell phones, but for most many people, it's a very useful uh, piece of info uh, piece of equipment to communicate with the pe people, and more communication brings more business, and more communication actually leads to better life for most of the people. And it's hard to develop to go to a to a point which speaks to the future and make there are there are reasons to be and and there are reasons to enhance your community to a better technology. And another thing I want to make uh, make a point about is that it was said in the in the meeting before that the tower actually environment environment affecting impact of this potential tower. And tower really doesn't give any environment impact except it's a viewing impact. There is no environmental effect of the tower as such because it's not going to interfere with any kind of environmental issue. It doesn't uh, affect people's health. It doesn't obstruct uh, because we are going to, it's shielded by trees and it doesn't affect uh, doesn't have any effect on human beings or any animals. So it's just a stationary tower which doesn't impact environmentally. Viewing, it, you can see tower. If, if, you, if, if there are trees in the summer, you won't be able to see the tower unless you are flying 100 feet above the ground or if there are no trees at all in front of the tower. So uh, I, I don't see it affecting environmentally on the area. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay, are there other members of the public who would wish to address the council? Hi, my name is Skylar Armstrong. I live on 18 Avon Road, which is in Shore Acres, and I do not have cell phone service at my house. 
And I just want to talk about, um, in the last meeting, when I, I'm the student council representative for the high school, in the last meeting we were here, one of the, um, the fire chiefs got up and talked about his problems with groups getting service. And he told a story about he was in Fort Williams and um, their radios don't work in Fort Williams, which I found very surprising. And since Fort Williams is the other area without cell phone service, that means that their radios most likely probably don't work at my house in Shore Acres. And earlier people were mentioning how the safety issue concern was sort of like conveniently there for the cell phone company's benefit. But I think that, like obviously for me, living in an area which doesn't get cell phone service and maybe doesn't even get radio service, the safety issue would be front and center, not just worrying about whether or not I can see a cell phone tower when I'm running down the road or walking past the area where the cell phone's being built. And I'd also like to mention that I live in Shore Acres, so I remember when they proposed to build a cell phone tower in Shore Acres and that, what a huge debacle that was and a huge debate there was. So I think that wherever they decide to put a tower, which is obviously needed because it's not fair that some people, like that the police have to worry about where the radios are, there's gonna be controversy and there's gonna be debate. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Just as a quick aside, while while this woman's coming forward, uh, congratulate Skyler on being a member of the girls' state championship swim team, and she also added points to the team, coming in fourth statewide in your event. So that's great. <laughs> I'm Beth Skytech. I live on 14 Fenway Road. And I'd like to know exactly what happened with the um, issue of putting the tower or whatever it was they were going to put on the water tower in Shore Acres. I grew up in that neighborhood, so I heard quite a bit about it from my mother. And I understand that it was defeated because of whatever reason, but I know it was a huge issue in that neighborhood. And I'm, I find it interesting that there's no cell service on Avon Road because my mother lives on the corner of Avon and I've used my cell phone there with no issues at all. And I'm not saying they don't have a problem, but what did we do before cell phones? Thank you. Hi, Carl Dittrich, Ocean House, 500 Ocean House Road. Just was listening first. I was yeah. I'm thinking about that. Uh, it seems like it's a convenience. Um, I have a cell phone. I use it. It sometimes works in Torrey. It sometimes works in Broadfield. Not all the time. But I'm thinking at the, about those houses. Every house has a phone. At least one, if not five. If there's an accident, you can use a, a, a landline phone. Um, we don't have a hardware store. That's an inconvenience for me. We don't have a hospital real close. We don't have a mall real close. Um, that's some of the benefits of living in Cape Elizabeth. You take the good with the bad. Um, it's, it works sketchy, but it, it works. It's a, a, to me, it's a nice convenience, but worst case scenario, um, I'm in Broad Cove, a minute out, it, the thing works. It's going up the road. So you're only a minute away from the, the cell phone working. Um, that's how it is. Thank you. David Alexandria, I live on Susan Road, off of Fowler. And I really don't understand why we're proposing to put this tower in a spot and, and develop a new approved cell tower area when there's already an approved area at the transfer station that we could develop a cell tower that would be invisible essentially to the scenic areas um, and, and the scenic visitors to our town. And that would also um, solve the problem of special services communications. Thank you. Come on, line, just line right up. <laughs> I'm Bob Siegel. I live uh, on Brook Road, which is uh, dirt road off the Hannaford Cove Road. There's absolutely no cell phone service within uh, about a half a mile of my house. Um, and I just think it's an inconvenience. It's not a life and death thing since we do, as the gentleman mentioned, all pretty much all have landlines. 
Um, but I have, it's been an inconvenience because contractors and people coming to my house and in the general area try to use cell phones to find out where I live, which is kind of hard to find. Uh, and they can't use their cell phones. Uh, but my, my question was, uh, they're putting the tower, they want to put the tower where there's good cell phone coverage. Will I get cell phone coverage and will all the coastal areas get cell phone coverage from this tower? If not, then what they're telling us is not, you know, the full truth, I guess, is one way to put it. Because I got the feeling they said we're going to get it all, almost everywhere is in, in the case. And I'm just wondering if the two lights and the uh, half a cove area uh, will get coverage. Might ask uh, LCC to respond to that question of coverage. Can leave that one up. Just put the other one over it. Right over it. questions about uh, transfer stations. We didn't, we did try to use transfer stations as a site, but we could not cover the shore inserts in the Creepy area. And I did run the analysis for transfer station site, and I could not cover the southern part of the, uh, of the cable. Could you, could you speak up, please? Yes. Uh, we did try to use transfer station as a location for the tower, and the analysis showed that we do not cover completely the southern part of the uh, uh, Cape Elizabeth. And we did submit those plots to town uh, in the planning board and uh, in the town in the uh, uh, workshop. We submitted those. And, uh, and how well we cover with this tower, the town, is shown on the, we, I, I do want to compare or show three plots to everybody what, what we analyzed earlier. But, uh, the first plot here, which is, which is the existing coverage from, uh, I'm sorry, this is, these are, there are three plots and what we tried to show is what is the coverage we're gonna get out of the uh, spray property tower in Cape Elizabeth and if we had to put a tower in Fort Williams, what kind of coverage we will get with that tower and what will happen if we put the tower in the shore acre. And you can see the best coverage in the town or the maximum possible coverage we could achieve out of a tower is in the Sprague area. And I have uh, included the, uh, uh, the population count from 2000 census overlaid on the coverage which, is, which we are going to achieve out of the spray tower here on this slide. And in that, there are a lot of uh, black polygons made, and each polygon show the amount of people which were counted in 2000 census. And if you look, uh, this is the polygon here, one polygon, which is the shore acre areas and the Cool Lake State Park. There are about 1,824 people live according to uh, uh, 2000 census. And the other one, uh, other... Excuse me, and that just uh, to be complete, that includes Broad Cove as well, I think. Yes, it does include Broad Cove. And if you look, there is a polygon here which actually includes the Spurling Avenue and its Holmes Road go up. Sorry about that. Um, how, it's, it's 77 basically. Starting from here, that has 2,050 people, 
and that we do cover with the help of Sprague and Spurring Avenue Tower. And the only place we do not cover with the, with the addition of the Sprague Tower is the Fort Williams area. And if you look at the Fort Williams volume, which is almost this area, which is about 2,702 people, but we do cover about 70% of that polygon, and we do have coverage in that area. And most of the complaints which we have from Shurik and St. Ross Cove with the addition of Spray Tower with the height we have proposed, we will cover those areas, including the uh, emergency service issue areas of uh, Crescent Beach and Two Lights State Park, including some portions of Hedges Beach. Madam Chair, tower. could I ask a question for yes. clarification? So that larger map in the upper right hand, that map, shows the green is the coverage. The green is and in car coverage prediction. Okay. The and the white spots uh, on it, which are a little hard to see from far away, but are basically around Fort Williams and then some white spots down on the Sprague property and then right along the shoreline of, um, I guess, two lights. Broad yeah, Cove th in there because of, is it and that's because that's of because ground sloping off towards the you, water. When you really reach at the edge of the sea, uh, the, the ground goes down to the sea level, and it's a sharp change in the terrain uh, elevation. Right, so it's in and shadow. It's basically. exactly in the shadow, and it's shown in the prediction also, which shows the accuracy of prediction because <laughs> if it was not accurate, I'll show you covered there too. Okay. So basically, what you're showing is that. Of all the the plots you tried to do, putting the tower a tower at different places, this was the best spot for covering maximum the highest amount of population, the maximum amount of population, Landmark, and maximum, maximum coverage. Yes. Okay, yes, thank sure. you. I just wanted and, to be sure. And like the question was before that, did we try the transfer station as a site plan? And we did try that. And we actually were pursuing the transfer station before. We actually even started looking at the areas where we could build power. And I did have this top, this propagation map submitted before to the town. And here I, I had analyzed all the possible. Now this, this plot actually it's shows. Council can't uh, see that. Maybe if you, you held it up so that both the audience and the okay. can see it about where that All is. Right. Well, yes, that would be good. Prop corner. And actually, we did. Actually, this is the current prediction of the coverage. And like somebody pointed out that show records, they have coverage and they don't have coverage, which is basically represented here that some spotty coverage is in there in that area. And what we did is we used trip transfer station as a site and you can still see that the the Crescent Beach area and the area here in the on the Sprague property and some of the edges area still don't have still have the spotty coverage and we tried the Sprague location with 150 feet here we haven't increased the height and we cover much better than what we did cover from uh, transfer station and then this is the this is plot shows the emergency services if they, if emergency uh, services were installed at the Sprague location, how it's going to cover the area around here. And that is on 800 megahertz, not on PPS frequency. Okay. Councilor McGinty. Was the tra transfer station 150 or 180? That was 150 feet. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think the question's been are there, Thank let, you. Let's yes. go back to the public hearing, and then if we have other questions, we can ask them. So are there other members? Thank you, though, for answering that question that came from a member of the public. Are there other people here to speak? Thank you. Sure. I'm Tom Blair. I live at 301 Fowler Road. I now, am now a little confused as to the transfer station site. If line of sight is the issue, what would it take for the for that site to work. Is it height or is it money or is it investment in the tower? What if what this 180 foot tower at the corner of 
power road in, in 77, 150 foot tower, and it doesn't work. I'd like to know what investment it would take to make it work. Would, I don't think we'll be going back and forth. I, I think we need to have our public comments, and then if counselors have questions along those lines, they can be pursued to them all at once. And I would when, invite when one we're of the in our discussion. Okay. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just for the public, I'm not trying to cut off your questions. I, I think you should come up and raise your questions but then we'll have an opportunity to get into a further discussion and this will be the most efficient way to permit all of you to speak. My name is Tom Corelli. I live at 297 Fowler Road and uh, I really appreciate what Mr. Sprague had to say about um, his contribution to the community, the land and conservation and so forth, and that this tower would really help offset the increased taxes that this corporation has to pay in the town. I really appreciate what he had to say, but uh, my neighbors, particularly my neighbors, um, Gary and Susan Long, um, how are they being compensated? Because if you just step out on your deck, there's nothing to block that power in their, their view of that power. And my other neighbors, I live almost directly across the street from that power. How are they being compensated? So that is my um, point in this uh, whole discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other members of the public? I kind of wish you'd let us applaud because then we wouldn't have to stand up here and do this. <laughs> um, I'm concerned about the tower. Oh, could you state your name oh, and address? Gail please? Parker, 317 Fowler Road. Thank you. I am concerned about the tower, and I, ha and I guess my biggest concern is that I have so many questions about it. And I'm not quite sure what the forum is to get the answers to those questions. I understand that tonight, as I understand it, we're basically saying to you, ask more questions. Um, I got a flyer in the mail that showed the outline of where the proposed lot would be. But it just made me full of questions. Tonight has just given me a lot more. Obviously, we need good emergency service communication. I don't think anybody would argue with that. But that's one whole question that I hadn't even heard of until I heard of the cell phone tower. And I'm not sure that the two have to be linked. I mean, I think that everyone in this town would support whatever was necessary to get better emergency service communication. I have a dad who lives over in Shore Acres, and he walks at 85 at 5 a.m. and I bought him a cell phone for Christmas, and it doesn't work over there where he, walk, where he walks. So I understand some of the people who want the cell phone coverage, but we have sacrificed all of us who live in this town a great deal for the benefits of living in this town. We give up a lot of the things that towns, other towns have. We pay higher taxes in some cases, and we're willing to do it because we like having no McDonald's in town. We like having to, we're willing, at least put it that way, we're willing to drive the extra miles to get to some of the things that we have to get to in order to preserve this. It's part of, um, part of the balance we make when we choose whether to live in this town, when we examine all of those things. I think of this 150 foot tower, and I try to think of it not as a tower, but as a building. And I find myself wondering, what does this 150-foot building offer our community compared with what another 150-foot building? We talk about affordable housing. I can only imagine the outcry if someone brought to the planning board a proposal for a 150-foot tall building that provided affordable housing. We talk about using church steeples. I have to wonder if Cape Methodist, with all of its acres, took proposed 150 foot steeple, which would accommodate this, what the town center planning people would think about a 150 foot steeple in the town center. I really have a concern about the cost of this, the emotional, visual, everything, cost of this improvement to the town. How long will it work? I think the questions about computers becoming outdated it's a very good question. How long will 150 tower work? I've also heard 
two figures. I've heard 150 and I've heard 180. Which is it? And again, I echo the question about what could be done with the town transfer station. Maybe we just can't have it. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of interest in cell phones and there's a lot of value to cell phones. But I think there is also value to some of the other things that we have kind of as a community chosen to give up on in order to preserve parts of the community that we want. I would just like a much clearer opportunity for the townspeople to see really clear maps of this is the coverage that we're gaining, this is what we're not gaining, these are the questions, these are the options, and think creatively outside of the box to solve this public safety question and be able to look at this without the public safety issue attached to it. To just say, okay, this is the tower, this is what it gives us, this is the cost, and then we'll be able as citizens to decide much more effectively and much more wisely in terms of whether it's a good choice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you need to put a big sign up here that says, please turn off your cell phone during this meeting. Are there other members of the public who would care to make some comments? Yes, hi, uh, Mark Stanfield, 229 Salad Um I guess there's a couple of points. A lot of people have brought up some uh, very interesting aspects of this, and uh, I, I don't believe we have all the answers. Um, part of the difficulty may be in that originally, I, I think many of the people in the area thought that the um, cell tower plan was, was going to different locations. Uh, Maureen brought out uh, different listings of how they can progress. And originally, this was, um, nobody had thought that the cell tower was gonna be in a specific location. Uh, I, I, I think town-wide, there would be more discussion if this was recognized. This, this was going to be put in the middle of a field, basically, uh, where everybody coming into town was going to view the property. This goes right in the face of our comprehensive plan, which as far as I know, is supposed to be our Bible for planning. That uh, um, planning-wise, that the community has said that this area is a scenic area, that if at all possible, it should be less rural. And here we are, once again, putting up 150 foot, 180 foot um, tower, um, where everybody coming into town is going to look at it, and the people in this town have said this is this should be a scenic area. Um, I, I think legally we should have an opinion as to whether the town council should even legally zone this area in this direction, since it is in the face of, of the comprehensive plan. Um, the next matter I'd like to bring up is some of the engineering work that these folks have uh, discussed. It, it seems to me that it's, it's, it's pretty rosy projections, what, what they have uh, provided, that this is absolutely the best spot. Well, it, it, it isn't the best spot, just for the fact that it isn't a height of land. There are many spots higher in town than this location. If you went just 500 feet to the west, uh, um, as Greg pointed out, there was a ridge line right there. A ridge line is higher elevation, you're going to best get better coverage. Um, the hill where the water tower is, is going to block the line of view of a lot of areas. That area naturally is a better location. It's, it's a height of land. Taller areas give you that much more benefit. This area is in hollow knoll that was um, originally uh, um, probably some type of wetland or something that's been built. Um, I, I guess also I was confused by some of the maps that, that have been put out here. Um, we have different areas crossed off. This was originally, I believe, this map here put out to be the Sprague Field location, which shows that there are areas of two acres and 
balance are also missing. It, it just seems to me that we should have an independent engineering study done to find out what is physically the best location, rather than relying on a company who is going to monetarily benefit from this location. Um, I, I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to Greg Davis, uh, 235 Bowery Beach Road. Uh, I just want to voice my uh, opinion. I'm against this cell phone tower. Number one, I don't want it looming over my house. Uh, number two, uh, I don't think we need it. I really don't. Uh, right now, there's one tower in this town pretty much covers 80 percent of the town, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, to put up an equal size power to try and hit the remaining 15 or 20 percent of the town. Uh, and it's not even definitely going to be able to cover those areas. And you just said that it's not even going to be able to cover Fort William. And, uh, it just seems like a bad idea. There's uh, you know, another alternative that's got to be. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak? Seeing no one, I will declare the public hearing closed. I want to thank all of you who got up to speak and all of you who've come out. And at this point, a motion would be in order. Councilor swift Chaotta. Madam Chair, um, since we need to have a motion on the floor before we can start discussing it, I would like to propose that the town, town council um, accept the planning board recommendation to create a tower overlay district located in the area of Bowery Beach Road, Fowler Road, Charles E. Jordan Road. I have a second. I'll second the motion for purposes of discussion only. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilor Roberts. Thank you. Uh, when I came here this evening, I was uh, first off going to recognize the Spragues for their uh, certain amount of benevolence and community spiritness, but I found out there's also a, a money issue there. But that's all right. I'll still thank you for coming forward on it. And I wanted to acknowledge that we do need to extend uh, wireless service as a basic necessity for, for the people in this community. But I, I was disappointed. Um, I had emailed council and asked that, that perhaps we could spend $1,400 to set up a crane on the site at 180 feet to you know, enable everybody to have some sense of just exactly what it would like on that, look like on that corner. And budgets being the way they are, um, Councilor Moles was the only one to go back to me and said he was willing to go along with something like that, but uh, perhaps one of the cell tower companies could uh, come forth with the money and, and do that for us on other locations. Perhaps we should even require it. But here's, okay, here's the situation as I see it. U.S. Cellular would like to locate a cell tower somewhere in southern Cape Elizabeth that will fill a gap in coverage along the south portion of Route 77. They feel that this location gives them better land coverage than other locations they have looked at. But I would ask what's wrong with coverage going over the water. And we had mentioned in workshop mentioned a couple of spots. Uh, obviously, boaters want and need cell service also. And they don't have many options. Uh, and quite frankly, the land that is proposed to be covered is either already covered by another tower or extends over land barely inhabited. Here's the problem as I see it. The town council would like to address the lack of coverage along the coast from Shore Acres to Two Lights Road if we're going to be adding towers anyway. However, the neighbors in at least one of the neighborhoods we seek to help have said in the past, not in my neighborhood, when it was suggested that the water tower might be an appropriate location. Maybe it's time to revisit this possibility. Many more people have come to rely on the service and want wireless phones and wireless internet services. As best as I can tell from the limited amount of time that I've been able to put into the research, 
Several companies could locate their equipment on a single water tower and have it hidden from view, as apparently was done in Yama. Based on what we were told at a recent workshop, in order to reach, say, Broad Cove, a tower on the corner of Fowler Road and Bowery Beach Road would have to be about 180 feet tall to reach for the signal to reach out to that location. Now, the company originally had said 150 feet because they were only concerned with Route 77 and the traffic. Their interest was not in covering those areas of town that weren't covered. Uh, it's the council that has asked for that additional height to cover that. And since 180 feet is the maximum height we allow, it would, t in my opinion, and this has not been stated, people keep talking one tower, but it, if we allow it, it would take anywhere from three to six towers to accommodate the equipment of the major carriers so that they could also reach the coast. Because the graphs they've done at 150 feet don't reach. And if we're going to do the co-location, that's going to be impossible. We're going to maybe put one or two communication towers or pieces of equipment on each of those towers. So if you're not looking at one tower on this piece of land, you're looking at multiple towers. Now this is where I start to have a real uh, problem with the proposal. Is it fair to ask the residents of one area to welcome multiple towers into their neighborhood for the sole purpose of serving another neighborhood that has previously rejected the idea? And I don't think so. Perhaps it's time to take a step back and ask whether there might be less obtrusive options to satisfy a need that we all know exists. To start, I would like to have the town take a fresh look at utilizing the water tower in Shore Acres. And personally, I'd like to have an opportunity to go to Yarmouth and see firsthand for myself what they have managed to do there. And another option, possible option that should not be ruled out is the tower of the Nazarene Church on Route 77. Okay, there's no tower there now, but there could be. I spoke with Reverend John Twitchell this past week, and I asked Pastor Twitchell uh, when we were talking with him, he would love to have a steeple on the church, but the structural integrity of the building precludes doing so. This is a small congregation, and they simply don't have the resources needed to shore up the building to support a, a steeple. Well, you know what they say, God works in mysterious ways. Perhaps we have a match made in heaven and just waiting to be sealed. A tower company puts up the money to help the church, and the church waives the rental fees until the debt is paid. Worth pursuing? You bet. And of course, we also have an opportunity to help the local farming community. Can't you just picture it? Picking luscious strawberries at Maxwell's underneath the shade of an old communication tree. Okay, perhaps that's a little over the top, but we do need to step back and examine where we want to go and what the options are to get there, and that includes the Shore Road Fort Williams neighborhood. There are several issues that I have not touched on, but I will yield the floor to someone else and reserve the right to speak if no one else does. Thank you. Councillor Mould. Madam Chairman, uh, I share many of the same views that Councillor Roberts has on the issue. Uh, he and I discussed it the other day, and although I would like to see better cell coverage throughout the town, and I realize that there are needs for cell towers, uh, perhaps the transfer station, even if it's a 180-foot tower, would be a better site for such a tower. Uh, but, but most importantly, as much as I'd like to see cell coverage in Shore Acres and Broad Cove, I don't fear, I don't feel that it's fair to have to put one in this neighborhood to benefit another neighborhood. I wish more residents from Shore Acres and Broad Cove were here tonight to say why we should put a cell tower on the corner of Fowler Road as opposed to the top of the water tower. Uh, there are coverage technologies now, screening technologies that could be employed around a tower if it were to be put on the water tower at this time that would make that much more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so like Councillor Roberts, I think this needs further study. I'd like to see uh, more studies done around the water tower. And um, so I'm not prepared to approve this overlay district tonight. Councillor Backer. 
I look out at this and I hear the comments and I wonder how any cell tower has managed to be built anywhere in the country because everybody has the feeling that I'm sure we've heard expressed here tonight, not in my backyard. Yet, as we've sat here through this hearing, through this meeting, we've heard a half dozen cell phones ringing, which is simply an indication of the prevalence and the importance of cell phones today. Now, I don't know whose cell phone was ringing, but in light of the number of people we've heard speak in opposition, I have to assume that at least some of those phones were ringing in the pockets of people who are here to oppose the construction of the tower. Doesn't mean I'm in favor of construction of the tower, just an observation. I think we all need to be honest with the fact that cell phones are important to us. Um, the goal that I see here for all of this is to find the most efficient way to ensure placement of a tower in a way that will provide the greatest coverage with the least possible impact. I don't know where that is, but the one thing that I feel like I'm unable to do tonight is really make an apples to apples comparison because the maps that we've been shown illustrate a 150 foot tower at the transfer station and a 180 foot tower on Fowler Road with an obvious differential in coverage, I would like to be able to see a 180 foot tower at the transfer station. It may not be optimum coverage. It may be that when you compare the coverage of a 180 foot tower at the transfer station and a 180 foot tower on Fowler Road, that there is more coverage with a 180 foot tower on Fowler Road, but that doesn't mean that that's still the optimum location. I'm willing to trade off less than perfect coverage for a location that in the balance seems to provide the best coverage for the overall concerns of the people in Cape Elizabeth. And if the transfer station is a less intrusive site, even though it may provide slightly less coverage, I'd be more in favor of using the transfer station. Um, I am always so impressed with the Sprague family's generosity in sharing their land and the use of their land with everyone in Cape Elizabeth. Um, my hat goes off to them for everything that they've been willing to do in the generations that they've been here in Cape Elizabeth. The comment that was made about needing to lease land to help pay the taxes and the tax increase that they've suffered really struck deep with me. Um, I mean, we all ought to take that to heart when we think about uh, where we're headed with taxes in not only Cape Elizabeth, but across the state of Maine. Um, but that being said, all other things being equal, I'd rather see the rent paid to the town of Cape Elizabeth in a tower at the transfer station to increase our revenues to permit us to lower the tax base for everybody in town. Um, again, assuming that in the balance, it seems to be a site that works. Bottom line, I don't have enough information tonight to be able to approve this. Um, I'd like to see a 180-foot illustration at the transfer station. Um, and until we can really compare that, consider the options that Jack has raised, Council Roberts, um, I, I'm not prepared to vote in favor of this tonight. Councilor McGinty and then Councilor. Um, also, I, I agree with everything that um, that Councilor Backer just said, particularly that's why I asked what the height was at the transfer station, uh, being able to read it up there is 150 feet, and not having that 180-foot um, uh, demonstration to show exactly what would happen. So I agree with that, that we need to, to look at that, and also agree with all your tax comments that certainly we'd like to have the revenue um, to share the, that uh, wealth as well, lowering the taxes to, uh, to all the taxpayers. And also something that I believe uh, Councilor Mole said about we're putting a, a, a tower on the Fowler Road neighborhood 
that essentially is going to benefit the, the shore acres in Broad Cove and that whole area, two lights, that whole area, where five years ago, approximately five years ago, we tried to put a tower over there to help them, and that neighborhood didn't want a tower there. So I think that's an issue that we seriously need to look at. Um, if the people in that neighborhood want that coverage, if it can't be provided from a tower at the transfer station, then we should be looking at something closer to Shore Acres or Broad Cove to provide that service. So um, I guess I agree so far with everybody that we need, uh, I need more information. I'd like to look at this more in depth. I might add, this is my folder on cell towers <coughs> in Cape Elizabeth, and so it's not an issue I take lightly. Um, these papers have been around for five, collected over five years. There's a lot of issues that impact any tower anywhere in the town. I um, won't repeat what's been said, but I, I would agree with, with what John and um, Dick Beck have been saying. Um, I'm just not convinced that it's the proper place, uh, but I also think that if something worked out at the transfer station that could offer more coverage for cell phones, I also think that the issue of public safety really could be dealt with separately to get complete coverage. If, if the, um, if we couldn't get it for all the homes in the Cape for cell phones, because I think we can do repeaters um, that could make it work for public safety. Um, so, and that's one of my big concerns, is more public safety even than cell phones. I have to admit I'm not a cell phone owner. Um, I still have one of the old-fashioned ones in my car that you plug into the cigarette lighter and you can't take it anywhere with you at all. Um, so I, I just want to uh, look at this much more. I think a lot has happened since the committee we had studied it four years ago. Um, and we kind of left it in the middle, you know, in the middle of, of studying really. Councilor so. swift Teada. Well, I can certainly, I'm glad I brought this up for discussion. It sounds like the discussion is going nowhere. Um, I can count the uh, support or lack of support here. I just wanted to ask a question for clarification. We have a view of 150 feet at the transfer station and 180 feet at the Sprague location. But what we're missing is 180 feet at the transfer station. Is that that's what I hear Correct. the other counselors would like. Well, I would support getting that 180-foot uh, tower view at the transfer station. I am not convinced that it will be the, uh, the better location, but um, as I said, I can count to four, or in this case, five so far. So um, as the person who made the motion, I can withdraw the, I might as well withdraw the motion. Yeah. Um, well, I'd but like not to, to just not to cut yes. I, well, I would like to just make a, a few points. Um, Councillor Roberts has um, represented all of you very well, and I think was on the phone to probably most of us this weekend. And I told Jack I would consider um, his request to table this. Um, I did my own diligence, due diligence today. I drove all over um, the immediate coast, Richmond Terrace, Ocean Avenue, Pheasanton, two lights, every single street. Um, this service is, varies from good to poor. Uh, I'm troubled by the view that I get four bars of service on Fowler Road, so don't ask me to do anything on Fowler Road. We are a town. We are not a group of separate neighborhoods and ultimately I'm not I can count too so I know we're not going to do anything tonight but ultimately it will be my goal to do what's best for the entire town and I hope not be influenced by any neighborhood including my own if it was shown that this is something that would benefit the entire town and I think all of you really do feel that way too we bring our garbage to one area of town. The school is located in another area of town. I live near Fort Williams, and so I have to put up with traffic all summer long. Um, so we are, we are a town, and I, and I trust that all of us will look 
at this as a town. This also, as the company representatives point out, will benefit Scarborough. Well, we bring our garbage, our solid waste to Scarborough. So I, for one, am not about to, you know, just draw a border around this problem and say it's a Shore Acre problem or it's a Scarborough problem. Um, we're a larger community than that, and that's what I'll be looking for um, in the next month. Um, I also did want to say that the Sprague uh, Corporation's generosity to the town is just legion. Um, you know, the, the way that people use Great Pond, I am one of those people that parks at Sprague Hall and, and walks on the road frequently. So um, I'm certainly sympathetic. Um, on the obsolescence argument, um, I, I have to say I'm not at all swayed by that for this reason. If I need a computer today, and I know darn well five years from now the computer I buy today will be obsolete, but I'm still going to buy one today. So we have a cell phone issue, service issue in this town. We have a public safety issue. Um, Gail Parker, if your dad falls at 5 a.m. with his cell phone, you're going to want to know that he's got at least one bar of service over at Shore Acres. So um, I, I think the fact that we may have better technology five years from now isn't a reason not to do anything today. Um, and lastly, a lot of people said there were a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. Um, but I, I think that we have had a very open process. Um, it's been to the planning board. The planning board um, has studied this. It's my understanding that it was well noticed. Um, it's not the town council's job to find a better location or a perfect location. There is not going to be any better or more per perfect location. Um, we have a process where uh, the private sector went out, they looked for a site, they found a site that they thought was appropriate. They negotiated with a private landowner who was willing to enter into negotiations. They went to the planning board, and in fact, it's been at the planning board for, what, Maureen, two, three months? Two months. Two months. That's, uh, rocket speed in, in government activity uh, space, but they went to the planning board. They followed the process. We have the planning board recommendation in front of us. Um, I personally don't feel the need to wait for the transfer station information, but I can count the votes. But I will say that I have a great deal of respect for the planning board process. I think they are the people best equipped to find a location and, um, and then come to us. So um, I have not heard of anyone talk about a flaw in that process tonight. No one came and said, I went to the planning board or I didn't get notice. Um, they didn't listen to this. Um, it wasn't considered. So. Um, Again, uh, next month, I assume that there's going to be a motion to table this. You, you've withdrawn your motion. It, will, it may be back in front of us. Maybe it won't be. But I, for one, will be looking at what's in the best interest of the entire town and not a single neighborhood. So I, I'm very sympathetic, and I'm really glad that all of you came out tonight. It's very important that we hear from all of you. Um, but in the end, I know that what you want us to do on all the issues before us is what's in the best interest of the town, which is our, our whole community, not just our neighbors. Would, so. um, I would entertain a motion from Councillor Roberts at this time, if you want to make one, Jeff. I was going to move to table it, but I think what I would prefer to do is that uh, we'd move that we refer, refer this item to town council workshop for further deliberation and possibly send it on to the planning board if so de deemed at that time. That would be my motion. Okay. Second. Discussion? Any discussion of the motion? Just, just a, a process issue. I, Councillor Roberts moved to refer this to a 
workshop and if it deemed at that time to refer to the planning board the council does not take votes at, at a workshop uh, so you know I'm not sure under that motion right. how that process would work then we'll just have it uh, I would move the refer, refer the item to a town council workshop for, for, for further deliberation and was there a second is there further discussion councillor Swift Gatta. I personally would rather um, table it until the next town council meeting because if we refer it to a workshop I'm just worried about the process dragging out so long I think various parties including the members of the public who are here who are here and at home um, are going to need some resolution on this and if we refer it to a workshop then we can't take a vote at a workshop so then we're going to have to deal with they're you know, not mutually exclusive we could table it until the next meeting and hold a workshop in the intervening time period we have a workshop scheduled for march 18th so that would accomplish dates on it just so it's not so open-ended okay, would you entertain changing your motion, motion to councillor swift kayata come up with she had the language over there when, could i ask when is our i don't have my calendar in front of me when is our workshop our workshop is march 18th then how would you accept an amendment to your motion that would say we'd refer it to, for the council to consider or discuss at our um, workshop on the 18th and then to have it on the agenda for our next council meeting which would be so the motion April, really is we are tabling it until our next regular meeting and we will work our eighth shop meeting that's right and in the interim we will have a workshop discussion on it is there a second <laughs> the second okay councilor i don't want to lose my second position i will have to say that i prefer original motion to um, to have this go to a workshop because I'm not sure that the answers to my questions the technology part of it um, can be done between now and the next council meeting or the workshop I would suggest that all counselors who have questions get them to the manager by the close of business today's Monday on Wednesday of this week and they can be forwarded to the, our planning department or the company and they can have answers on the 18th they have motivation he's nodding here the planning department works for us so they have motivation what I don't like to see is I mean this isn't Augusta it's not Washington DC we want to answer and get the answers to people's questions but we ought to be able to do it in a timely fashion is that acceptable do you have um, questions I, I guess I mean part of my concern is I don't think the responsibility is only with the cell company that is proposing the project I do think we have a town responsibility that's why you know five or six years ago we set up a committee special committee to study cell phone service I think it's better for the town to look at it in in a real in, in a thorough way that is is disregarding any specific proposal so that we can actually get the best coverage for the town mm -hmm. um, maybe we and and in addition I think after that committee did did its work um we hired an extra person to do some additional analysis for us. that may take some time maybe that's the best route to go rather than have the information come from this particular company councilor yeah. roberts my suggestion and actually in uh, referring to a workshop and then to the planning board which is inappropriate i guess but was that I didn't really expect it coming back next month I think there are a lot of questions that do need to be answered before I want to vote on where we're going with this so the, I think the motion to maybe I should okay I, I move can I, can I now, back there's off a motion the on the table? table right now there's a motion that's been seconded it wasn't made by you right. so Councilor Cliff Kayata <laughs> um, the reason that I would prefer to have it go to workshop and then be on our table our agenda 
the, the issue tables is, in my mind, that facilitates some closure for everybody in this room, including Sprague's, including all the residents, whatever, um, and the company. Um, and if all the questions are not, have not been answered um, at the workshop or in response to questions at the workshop, then when it comes up on the agenda in April, then it'll just be put off again. The questions won't have been answered. But if we don't table it and just say, let's send it to a workshop, then we can't even decide to, to put, you know what I mean? It's delaying it even more. And I think it's um, in the interest of everyone in the town to get some closure on this, just so that everybody knows what's going on. And, and, and I don't see any downside. As you say, but there's always the option to table it if your questions exactly. are not answered and there aren't four votes to resolve it I mean, one way essence, or another. In essence, that's what's happening tonight. I mean, Councilor right. Backer brought up questions that he had that have mm -hmm. not been answered and so it's being put off. So. Councilor Malt. Additionally, Madam Chairman, I think we have two issues before us. One is a very specific issue that needs to be voted on in the very near future on this particular tower overlay zoning. And that really does need to be addressed for the fairness of L, uh, LCC and follow road residents. But then there is the overall issue of cell phone coverage and safety coverage throughout the town, which is not a one night meeting. That's going to require additional study. We may find that down the road we have a tower at the transfer station, maybe a small tower on the water tower, maybe a small, maybe still, maybe a small tower at Fowler Road that's less obtrusive. But that's not something that we're going to answer in, in, in one night, the overall issue. But I think we do need to come back next month, if possible, and vote on the issue that's before us. Okay. All in favor of tabling this item until next month meeting and having a discussion at our workshop on the 18th. And I would encourage people who have questions of what any party, I'm not limiting it but to get your questions to the manager so that we can have a fulsome discussion on the 18th. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? Councilor Fritz opposed. Thank you. I want to thank all of you again. Thank you. I just want, we, we will not be sending additional notices for these meetings. Uh, the agendas will be posted on the website, but there won't be additional notices sent out. And I do want to thank all of you again for um, taking the time to um, come tonight, and many of you also sent emails, so we do appreciate your input. Thank you. We're going to take a, a couple of minute break um, for those people watching at home before we continue on so that we can allow the room to clear. One oh six action on a proposal to lease additional space at three forty three Ocean House Road to Cape Mortgage Company. And there is um, a memo in your package from the town manager. Um, he is proposing to um, add an amendment or an addendum to the lease at three forty three Ocean House Road. That is the community services building. Cape Mortgage Company is currently located in the building. Um, we have vacant space in the building. They would like to expand. It appears to be a win-win situation, and I understand that Councillor Mould would like to move to recuse himself. Yes, Madam Chairman. On, on this issue, I'd like to recuse myself from the discussion. Uh, although I am not an employee of Cape Mortgage, I do subcontract to them. Uh, the actual owner of Cape Mortgage is Jeff McClellan, who's here in the audience today. If, if you have any questions, I'm sure he can answer them for you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, 
um, usually. Should I make that as a no, motion? Or no, you no. Usually the counselor leaves the podium and just okay. doesn't participate in the discussion at all. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And so at this point, can I have a motion? I would move the Councilor Mole to be recused from uh, participating on this item. Second. And any further discussion? All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six in favor. Thank you. And can I have a motion <laughs> on the lease? Councillor Swift Teada. Um, I would recommend that the town mayor to be authorized to, to sign the addendum um, on the lease of space at 242 Ocean House Road for the Lord um, And a second? Second. Any discussion? Councillor McGinty. Um, as I've said, I know I'm on the losing end of this, and I may even support this because it is a revenue enhancer for the town. It's going to bring us uh, approximately 8400 more dollars, which we're always looking for revenue sources, such as leasing tower space at a potential uh, tower at the, at the transfer station. However, I, I, I'm uncomfortable in taking off the market one of our only affordable housing units, in fact, the only affordable housing unit that the town of Cape Elizabeth actually controls and has uh, custody over. Um, you know, Cape Elizabeth, as we've heard, is a very expensive place to live. Taxes are a burden on a lot of people. Uh, people can't certainly, some people certainly can't afford to buy homes in Cape Elizabeth. And this was an opportunity for at least one person or a family, a small family, I suppose, um, to live in Cape Elizabeth. So I'm disappointed that we're going to take um, this piece of property um, off the market as affordable housing. I was at the uh, Cape Elizabeth South Portland Chamber of Commerce dinner that they had, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, I guess it was, a week ago. And one of the, one of the hotel managers there thanked the South Portland council members for providing for affordable housing for many of his employees um, who, who need affordable housing or at the lower income level. Um, and that kind of caught my ear um, that here we are, we have one unit and we're about to take it off the market. Um, so I'm kind of torn between the enhanced revenue, um, certainly enabling a, a, a company that uh, supplies services to the town and is a, uh, a loyal and productive uh, business member of our community. Um, so I'm torn between it. I think I'm gonna vote for this, but I just want to um, state my concern about taking that that off the market. Councilor Pritz. Um, I, I plan to support um, leasing to the Cape Mortgage Company and have this be office space as opposed to an apartment. I think it's, it's not that easy an apartment, I think, to rent. I mean, it, it is very small and it's up to, to, on the third floor. Um, but I did support this before when we had some earlier discussions and um, I'm in favor of getting $8,400 in income for the town. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, all in favor? Two, three, four, five, six in favor, thank you. And Councilor Moe, if you can come back now. And uh, the next item is item 107. It's an action to, on a request to rezone this gravel pit on Fowler Road. Apparently, uh, there is a memo in your package from uh, Mike McGovern and apparently L.P. Murray and Sons and Carol A. Murray have requested the rezoning of the gravel pit on Fowler Road. Um, they are considering the possible relocation of the business and maintenance facility currently located at 1230 Shore Road. Did I skip an item? No. no. Huh? And um, it is suggested that this be referred to the planning board. I just had a question. Yes. What do they want it rezoned to? Yes. Yeah, uh, in discussions that the planner had with uh, Skip Murray, one of the, the principals, the, the principal of, of L.P. Murray, the president, I guess, uh, it was suggested that he leave it deliberately vague so that the planning board could, could work through the process and, and if they were inclined to, to assist this business to, uh, 
to find a way to rezone it to make it appropriate. So that, that's why it was sufficiently less aged. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That your question also, Councillor Fritz? Right. I was wondering whether the intention was to expand the business zone or the definition, or you know, I, it. It was intentionally less aged. Okay. Councillor Mall. I, I'd just like to say that Skip Murray and the rest of his clan do an awful lot for the town, and um, I would like to make a motion that we send this item request to rezone the gravel pit on Fowler Road to the planning board. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven in favor. Okay, the next item, item 108, is a request from the Thomas Memorial Library trustees to approve their revised bylaws, and those bylaws are in your package. I trust that you all have had a chance to review those. Is there a motion? Councillor Swift Keata, thank goodness you've come back from vacation. I don't know what we'd do without you tonight. Um, I would um, like to move that the council approve the revised bylaw of the Thomas Memorial Library Trustee. Second. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Backer. I know this came before us previously and we provided input to it. I have this proclivity for rereading something that I've read before and seeing things that I didn't see the first time through. Um, and maybe there's... You may have to invoke the doctrine of estoppel. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Um, but I, I guess the, the primary question I have before we vote for approval of this, and maybe it's just something that can be taken up later for further amendment if necessary, but it's this. Um, why is the library board set up to have officers serve for one year from the March meeting as opposed to from the January meeting? Because if, a, if officers are appointed by the council to serve on a calendar year basis and an officer is elected to serve on a fiscal March-to-March -March year basis, what happens when an officer's appointed term ends as of 1231? Then there is no officer to serve from January 1 until the March meeting. And I can see how you might have one or two or a few officers whose terms expire, their appointed term expires as of 1231, and then we have um, a 60 to 90 day period without any he officer for the first of the year. And the town manager has tells me he can respond to that. Yes, Councillor Backer. Uh, the, this has been debated several times over the years by the library trustees and by the town council. And the, the feeling is, is that the outgoing board should not elect the, the officers. That they should be elected once the new individual board members have been seated, uh, which would not take place until at least January, uh, and that they ought to get a chance to uh, know each other a little bit before they elect their officers for the year. In, in the meantime, in those instances when boards have had and do have much expirations for officers, they have elected uh, interim leadership uh, at the close of the year, acting chairs, uh, or in the case of certain boards with vice chairs, to continue to serve in the interregnum until uh, the March, the officers are elected in March. Okay. Is there further discussion? Well, in that case, I only have two small items of Article 3, Section 1. I suggest that we strike the second sentence, which says each shall serve for one year, merely because it's redundant. Um, section 3 of the same article 
covers that in detail. It says officers shall serve from one year from the March meeting until their successors are elected. Um, and the other item is even smaller, Article 7, Section 1, on the third line, it says meeting of the board provided that. It just simply needs to be a D added to the word provide. With those two very small items, I am in full favor of this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Fritz. In terms of the Article 3, Section 1, that each shall serve for one year, it seems to me, if I, if I recall, and maybe Deborah could answer um, in the back of the room, that on other boards and commissions, we allow a chair to serve two terms, two one-year terms? Right. So that it seems to me we ought to be consistent with this board, as with all the other. We've tried to make them consistent. So there is a term limit for chairs, and I would... I don't remember that we mentioned secretaries, but those are the officers we're talking about here. There apparently is not a limit here, and I'm, I'm not concerned about that. Um, it seems to me that the library trustees are, first of all, there is a limit. I don't know where part of my microphone went. Um, there is a limit, a uh, term limit <laughs> for for the trust, this is why meetings should never go past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> there is a term limit for trustees. They can't serve more than two terms, and if among themselves they agree that someone should be chair for three years. But that's that's the way it is with with the other board. I there is a term limit for uh, terms that are three years, but. The idea is not to have one person dominate as chairman. If Madam, would you like me to answer that, Madam Chairman? Yes, while I'm yeah, looking I for my microphone. I guess there it is. Yeah, I think, Carol, your, your point is well taken. The, uh, this particular bylaw is in no way <laughs> limits it to a single one-year term. It says it's intended to imply that the term is one year. The operational document that governs all boards and commissions is the council's policy on standing boards and commissions that you worked with Deborah Lane and the appointments committee on, and that is where it is addressed specifically as to the term limitations, and those would apply to the library trustees, uh, and and the limitations that are in that document uh, make clear that uh, it isn't just limited to one year, but they are elected one year at a time, as opposed to the intent here is to say not two years at a time. Well, I think this is going to create confusion, though, if this says one thing in the time, you know, which one are the, is the board going to look at? I, I think what Councillor Back is suggesting of eliminating that one line there, I, I think it, it clarifies it by only keeping it in the other location. So he's proposing to eliminate that one line there. Councillor Roberts. I'm probably nitpicking, and this should have probably been done in the workshop, but basically on what uh, Councillor Backer has said, but I would just say not more than one year unless re-elected to a second term because when you strike that out entirely, it leaves an open strip court. Elect somebody for two or three years as chair without having a second vote. Or am I just, or again, is it the hour that's getting to us? There's no right way for me to answer that as question. A, as a, I would <laughs> say, as a former member of the library trustees, it, it was more of an issue to find someone who would agree to do it. <laughs> because it, it's extra work, so. But I'd just like to ask Councillor Swift Teata if she would accept Councillor Backer's suggested amendment. I would, but I can't remember. Did I make the motion? <laughs> you made the motion. Then I would accept the amendment, and I would like to move the question. Okay. What was the other strike? The strike was on Article Three, Section One. And the other each shall serve for one year. What was the other strike? The other strike was in Article. It wasn't a strike. It was actually adding in Article Seven the letter D in the word provide to make it the past tense. Or maybe it's the super perfect or something. <laughs> I can't remember those maybe grammar rules. So 
John. So that but we are changing. I don't see the word intent. provide in that. It's on the third seven. line, Article oh, Seven on the last page, it. third line. Thank you. Uh, high school girls, students, young women are starting to laugh at the way we're conducting business at this reason. late hour. <laughs> Could we move the question, maybe? Yes, we'll move the question. All in favor? Five six seven zero. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item 109. It is a request from Thomas Panansky to vacate a portion of the paper street known as Overlook Lane, and this is in Shore Acres. And um, there's a, a memorandum in your package from the town manager. You will recall that um, this is the second request from Mr. Panansky for the abandonment of a paper street, and it is recommended that we refer this to the planning board with a request for the board to review all paper streets in the immediate area, and I think by that the uh, meaning is Shore Acres, not Shore Acres. Can we define the immediate area I, for the I, purpose of the public understanding? The, the, the intent is that the whole series of paper streets on as you go down uh, in Trundy Road and then down Repro on the left side of the road. It's not intended, and we wouldn't want to allow folks to be looking at the, the, the paper streets that are immediately along the coast of Okay, so it's the, the north, side. it's Trundy Road and it's to the, the north side, it's the east side. It's the paper street to the north, northerly and westerly side of Trundy Road and Repro. Okay. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> Councillor Mould. A couple of quick questions. Uh, Madam Chairman, if I might ask the manager directly. Yes. Means. Is this an easement? I, I read through the documents, but is this an easement or is this town-owned land? Pa paper streets are, are lands that w are reserved at the time of a subdivision for the possible location of streets. Under state law, they're, they're owned sort of in common by everyone in the subdivision. Uh, when they're abandoned, uh, you split it right down the middle and half of the paper street goes to one. the abutter on one side, the other half goes on the other side. There's also, the, the, the town has looked extensively at a lot of paper streets and when John was here, Carol was on the council, and maybe Mayor and Marianne or Jack, we, we uh, the council, extended our rights to paper streets that otherwise it would have all gone null and void back in mm -hmm. 1997. So it's, it's neither an easement or we everyone in the subdivision has an ownership right to it and in in this under the statute uh, at, the, at the burden cost burden of the applicant notices would be sent to everyone in the subdivision under the state statute that governs but this isn't land or a right to land that we could sell to the individual? Under the state statute dealing with paper streets, no. No. Okay. Any further discussion? We're I just, just sending this to the planning board. Yeah. I, I just had a question. Are all of the shaded sh streets on here considered paper streets on the map that we got? Yeah, uh, no, no, Michael. Michael, some of them are not. For instance, Maureen says the answer yes. Well, Algonquin Road extension is a paper street. Is shaded. It's a paper street. Okay, but it's also a street where there are houses and people drive. That's down. right. It's it's one that you would not want to abandon because of access. Yeah, a lot of the paper streets that you generally look at abandoning, abandoning are the ones that folks aren't using. If folks use them, they begin to come wary that you know maybe. They could get shut out somehow or closed off. Or okay. Madam Chair, I'm sorry to ask another question, but um, so if they are using them, why are they a paper street? Maybe I'm not. If they what? If if it's a street that people are indeed using, using. why is it are a paper using? street and not a real street? It, it's it's shown on a piece of paper, yeah. not that it becomes a paper street. It's also an unimproved unaccepted street, okay. very similar to a private road or a private driveway. However, since it was originally laid out as part of the subdivision as a paper street, it retained that nomenclature. So do we plow them, for instance? Yeah. Yeah. Did I do okay? Okay. 
Do we, so do, does the town no, we plow? Do not plow paper streets. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, it, let me, in a couple of instances we do, but the general policy is we don't. We will plow one if we're doing a loop and we would have to lift our blade and, you know, it's just for the public safety. There are a couple of them we do in fact. Some of the trees are too big. Yeah. It makes sense, okay. Uh, any further discussion? This is going to, the motion is to have it go to the planning board. All in favor? Two, two, four, five, six, seven in favor of sending this item to the planning board. And item 110 is an action to accept a gift of a quit claim deed for property located at the end of Fenway Road. There is a quit claim release deed in your package and you will recall that the purpose of accepting this is to create an easement or a right of way that the public can use to cross from the end of Fenway Road onto land and trails that would get them ultimately to Great Pond. And we have workshopped this issue and I wouldn't expect a whole lot of questions, but I'll move Councillor Moll, I went, Sir. are you gonna make a motion, Councillor Moll? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to uh, Madam Chairman, make a motion that we accept this very generous gift from the Palanza estate, uh, Mr. Palanza, to accept this quit claim deed for property located at the end of Fenway Road. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Yeah. This, this, is, this has been a long time coming and it's a, a goal that the council had for several years and I think it's really great progress that we're making here. I wanted to add a similar comment. I wanted to thank the Conservation Commission for their work on this. Our attorneys, uh, Mr. Palanza, who s signed the Quick Claim Deed, deed and especially uh, Maureen O'Meara, who, who really is responsible for keeping this issue alive, of approaching Mr. Palanza, of getting the deed offered and signed so that when, when it was considered, so that when it would, would be considered, it, we would know it was all in place and all the pressure would be in. So she really did a lot of work on this. Uh, over a number of years. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Further discussion? All in favor of accepting the quit claim deed? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. And the next item is an item from the Ordinance Committee. It is a recommendation to prohibit parking on the southwesterly side of Fenway Road, and a public hearing is recommended to be scheduled April. 12, 2004. Councillor Backer, you're chairman of the Ordinance Committee. Do you have a motion? I move that the um, recommended amendment to the traffic ordinance be set for public hearing on April 12, 2004. Okay, second. 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 Any discussion? With okay. one change. Oh. <laughs> you want to amend your own motion? <laughs> um, on page five, yes. uh, where, which is where the, the change has been made, there's been a paragraph Q. Q added. And just by adding the paragraph Q, we should move the OR, which is now at the end of paragraph O, okay. down to P. P should end with a semicolon OR. And a period, a period. at the end of the Q. Right. In a period at the end of Fenway Road, unless we want to leave that open for the possibility of adding an R at a later date. <laughs> okay. As the seconder, I will accept that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any further discussion, <laughs> Councilor Roberts? I just prepare the council for another busy evening because I've already heard from neighbors that aren't happy about no parking on the sh on one side of the road. So. Well, we Be might advised. as well do it all on the same night because it's the same neighborhood. <laughs> there, there, uh, Madam Chair, there, yes. there was some, I don't know, confusion, some discussion about which side is the southwesterly side or it's north or whatever, but that as you drive into Fenway Road, the no parking would be on the right-hand side of the road. As you're driving to, In, towards, the, towards the, the cul de sac, towards the dead end, it'd be on the right-hand side, no parking. Yes. That's what I understood. Right. So, um, all in favor of scheduling this for a public hearing at the April 12th council meeting. Before. 
four one two three four five six seven zero okay item 112 is a request from the school building committee to hire Peyton construction company as the construction manager um, I don't know if you all got the letter that I received this weekend you all did so your package has been supplemented um, there were interviews um, Michael McGovern was involved in that. I don't know, Michael, if you want to share any light on it, but it is the building committee's recommendation um, to authorize um, the hiring of Peyton, and um, they did send a motion along. Councillor Swift-Hata, I found it. I think she found it. <laughs> I, I found um, on the last page there is a, a suggested um, motion however i have some concerns and um i don't want to make the motion to do it because i don't support it as it stands now, okay. but i have questions for the manager and i don't know if you want to make motion. a different motion then i think mm -hmm. that would be in order we could discuss a different motion i don't know if i want to make a motion because i have some questions Well, yeah, I don't want to make a motion and then not support my own motion, so. Okay, well, I'll make a motion just for the purpose of discussion, and it can be withdrawn, and I would move that um, the superintendent of schools be and hereby is authorized to execute and deliver a contract for the construction services with Peyton Maine Corporation for the high school renovation project. Um, and that contract shall be in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools um, and shall also provide for the development of a guaranteed maximum price that adequately provides for the completion of the project within the 7.93 million dollar budget approved by the voters i'll second for purposes of discussion i'd like to hear what yes and i'm only making it for the purposes of discussion i'm certainly more than willing to amend the motion um madam chair my my concern and i if the manager has any answer for this i i'd be happy because i know you're on the building um my concern is that i've never seen the, the uh, council approve executing a contract for something of this magnitude when there was no price associated with it I, i'm I, i'm not sure i understand what the fee is for peyton i i have no concern about peyton themselves but this seems sort of vague to me that the contract shall be in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools but i feel like we're missing some information here where mr manager can you shed any light on this I, Maybe I'm being overly cautious, but it is a big project, and I don't know how much. I participated in the selection process until the time they narrowed it down to the firm. As the letter from uh, the school building committee chair says, a potential contract has been submitted by Peyton is under review by the school department's attorney. Uh, their request is for permission for both the town council school board to enter into a contract agreement. It's highly unusual to ask the council to approve a contract when I haven't seen it, when, uh, you know, I have no idea what it says. Uh, and even though I wouldn't be signing it, it's the superintendent. Uh, to answer your question, it's unusual. And I will say, at the building committee meeting last week, I suggested that we needed to have the terms and conditions. I don't know if you were there at that point. Michael, but I thought that we needed more in the way of at least a term sheet yeah. before us, and um, they weren't sure that they would have that, so at that point I had suggested that it may or may not get done tonight in terms I'm of an approval. I'm just concerned that so. it's so vague that I don't know what we're putting the town, the citizens on the hook for, for, for paying Peyton and what the terms are of them doing their job and it, it just seems really vague to me so that's Perhaps why the tabling motion is in order 
Uh, well, once we, ta if I know, once once we, we table, table, we can't have any discussion, so I, I wouldn't want to table it until everybody had a chance to speak. Okay, Councillor Mulls and then Michael. Well, I was going to make a motion okay. to table it, so. Yeah. I'm just going to su suggest the, you know, I've heard absolutely nothing other than, you know, this. Should, I knew this was coming, something was coming, and it, it, it came without any discussion from the superintendent at all. Uh, you know, I don't know what their timing is in terms of this. You do have a workshop on the 18th. I know there's plans for uh, the council chairs, maybe the finance chairs are going to be meeting sometime between now and the workshop next mm -hmm. week. I would suggest that maybe they could have a discussion on the council's concerns and that perhaps we could have a special one item uh, agenda uh, that evening to uh, you know, if it was the, if the council didn't want to pass this tonight to find out some I, of the information. If I could just offer a piece of information, the finance chair, I will be meeting with the finance chair on Wednesday. We try to keep in touch, the finance chair of the school board, uh, we try to keep in touch regularly. And uh, I would be willing to discuss that at this point. But I guess it was with my finance committee hat on that I was looking at this and wondering what we were committing the town to. I think procedurally, I'd like hmm. to withdraw. Now, can we just can I just say something yeah. before you do that? Um, I think Mike basically answered my question. I was concerned of a timeline. What kind of timeline the building committee is up against um, as far as getting the project off the ground? Um, certainly, I want to see all the, the information before we vote on it. Um, but and Mike answered that question. I guess we can have a special one-item uh, you know, meeting to approve it when we get the information. So I guess that kind of satisfies me, but I hate to see us drag this out too long so me that, you too, know. Me but yeah, yeah. Mr. Thatcher. Now this was something that we discussed at the building committee meeting um, just last week. I mean, this very issue as to what information, information the council would require. And it was Councilor Lynch who raised that. Um, and my recollection is that this is exactly where we ended up, that it would be, the council would be asked to approve this very open-ended I thought we would have more, motion. at least terms, at least, um, before us. I don't think so. I, mean, I don't think that was the expectation. Um, and I'm, I don't know, I'm personally comfortable with the notion that the contract would be in a form acceptable. Now this says only the superintendent of school. I'd like to have it in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools and the town attorney, and I also would be willing to have it be acceptable to the town manager. Um, I don't think that any of us as individual town councilors have the construction legal background to analyze a construction contract and comment on the appropriateness of it. We're gonna look to our town attorney to protect us in that regard. Um, so I, I'm not reluctant to approve this as it's submitted, except perhaps to I, I wouldn't mind seeing the approval, certainly the town attorney added um, as a condition. And I also frankly would like to see um, the eyes of our town manager um, on the contract and his approval. Before I would it's accept signed. the town manager and the town attorney as a friendly amendment since I haven't withdrawn my motion. Um, I, I think that makes sense, and the manager has a lot of experience now with construction. Just, just a court clarification on town attorney. Now, the school attorneys are looking at this. We don't want our, the municipal attorney to look at this also is that what you're saying or not you're just saying that well I don't know that it's the school attorney who's looking at it that's what I, the I, said. I, I, I don't that's what the the information letter said but it's not in the motion yes, uh, uh, um, I guess I'd look to our town manager to answer that who is looking at this as legal counsel for it would, the town? Be, it would be the school's attorney who would be Drummond Woodson uh, would be looking at it I within school construction law uh, it's the superintendent of schools who was charged with carrying forward school construction projects 
And for, th for that reason, we, you know, while I, I think, you know, I understand where the council's coming from, I think to add the manager uh, is, is not in keeping with the state statute. Uh, it, is, it is the responsibility of the superintendent of schools on school construction projects to be the signatory authority. That said, uh, you know, when we sat down with Peyton and interviewed them and interviewed the other firms, anyone here else involved in those interviews? Yeah. You know, every firm had criteria, we had criteria that we looked at, they had pricing proposals, they were percentages of construction, and, you know, quite frankly, even if they want an open-ended motion, I'm surprised that at least a bulleted summary was not included of what Peyton's proposal you was. Know, and frankly, that was what percentage. I thought I had asked for, was a list of terms and that I was told, and we were told, the committee was told, we may or may not have that on Monday. And I thought I responded, well, then I'm not sure what the council will do if we don't have that information. Councilor Mullis. Prior to Councilor Backer's comments and reinforced with Councilor Backer's comments, uh, they've gone through a process. They've obviously selected Peyton Construction Corp. as the business that they're going to do business with. Uh, I defer to the school building committee and the uh, school superintendent to, with the amended motion, come up with the right document, and I would support the, the document. To, to give them that permission to go forward tonight. I don't think we need to have all the, the details, because we're going to approve it. Dan? I agree that we don't need to have all the details, but I don't see that we have any of the details. We don't have any here. And what, I mean, maybe I'm just obsessed with the budget, but um, I would like to have an idea of what it's going to cost us to have this construction management firm um, to, to do this project for us. I, I, I am very hesitant. I, I, I cannot support um, such an open-ended contract. And that's not, the, I have absolutely no concern with the way the process has worked so far in terms of picking Peyton. I know nothing about Peyton. I haven't been involved with them, whatever. I'm sure they're a fine firm and a good choice for the project. But I am hesitant, since we have a fiduciary responsibility on the town council, I'm hesitant to put the town on the hook for what could be a big chunk of money when we don't even know what it is. I would hate to have somebody say, well, what did you just vote for? And I'd have to say, well, geez, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know, was it $10,000? Was it $100,000? Was it $500,000? I, I truly have no idea. So I'd like to know that just so I have a sense of uh, what it's going to cost. And I, I do agree with Councillor Backer that I think it would be good to have a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools and the attorney um, so that there's some legal review of it. But I can't support it with the lack of information. I, I just think I would be derelict in my duty. I didn't come tonight to to speak in support of this issue, but you know, I just want to uh, mention that they have a budget to live within. And I'm sure they're going to make the appropriate choice within that budget, and we're not going to be, you know, looking to them every month over their shoulder on a monthly basis on every decision they they make and everything that they spend. So, again, I just put my trust in the the building committee to to pick the right thing, but you know. If it waits a month, it's, it's okay with me. I just, if it's just a matter of moving yeah. thing along. Yeah. I don't want to delay the project, but I am on the building committee. Yeah. And I did say last week at the building committee meeting, what are the terms and what will we see before Monday night? And I, I just don't feel comfortable voting on what we have. I, I feel as if we're, I realize it's not a blank check. There's an overall limit. But like uh, Anne, I'd like to know at least the parameters of 
what the contract, it's a very large contract which the town ultimately is responsible for um, and the taxpayers. So I'd like to have more information and I'm, okay. I think we could have a meeting on the 18th before or after our workshop if need be so that we don't hold up the process but that would give them time. I would just yeah. like to reiterate for the record that I have no negative impression of Peyton. I have no concern about their choice. And I also have no desire to slow down the process, but I think this is important enough so that if we can deal with it at our work workshop, I don't think it's going to slow things down very much. And I think it would be uh, best for the town to hold off tonight. So I'm going to withdraw my motion. And I'll offer a motion to table it. I will move that we table this to the workshop on the 18th okay. uh, or so at a special, a special meeting. meeting. A special meeting. I'll second that. And could we um, ask the school board uh, or the building committee, ask whoever, whoever got the information. The school the, board. The school board. The building committee won't meet. More again. information. Um, the, the basic parameters yeah. of price. I think, yeah, we'll ask uh, Tom Priscilla and um, Elaine Maloney, who is the chair of the building committee, as well as the school board member. Okay. All in favor of the motion to table? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and the next item. Hmm. is item 113 and uh, that is a recommendation from the appointments committee regarding vacancies on the planning board the recycling committee and the community services advisory commission carol you're chair of the appointments committee madam chair um the, the appointments committee recommends um we had three unexpired terms to fill one on the Planning Board, Recycling Committee, and the Community Services Advisory Committee. And we are recommending to the Council that the Planning Board appointment be Jack Keneally uh, for a term, unexpired term of Andy Charles until December of 2006. On the Recycling Committee, uh, the Appointments Committee recommends Alina uh, Perez-Smith and that term would end 123104. And on Community Services Advisory Commission, we recommend Laura Lee Shadle um, with a term ending 123104. Okay. Second. Any further discussion? You want me to make the motion? Oh, I thought it was, was second. Okay, that was the motion. I secure report as the motion. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? Councilman McGinty. Just, just as usual, I mean, it almost gets to be redundant that just great qualifications for all these people. Mm -hmm. um, their backgrounds are just outstanding. I mean, we just continue to get great people to serve on these committees and just say it again. Thank you. Thank you Madam to Chairman. all the citizens. Madam Chairman, I'd just like to say that as Councilman McGinty said and as Councilor, Councilor Fritz and Councilor Roberts know, again, we had a tremendously good crop of applications for town boards and it's very difficult for us to pick between some of these candidates in the case of Jack Keneally he has given tremendously good service to the town over the last several years on the zoning board of appeals which since he's moving up to the planning board is going to become an opening so just for for everyone's knowledge we had some great candidates looking at the planning board last time around. Perhaps they may want to come back around and, and apply for the soon-to-be-open Zoning Board of Appeals position. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, all in favor of the appointment? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. The next item Madam is... Madam Chair, um, as, as exactly <laughs> what Councillor Moles was saying, um, I'd just like to an announce that with that appointment and moving Jack Neely to the planning board, we will have an opening on the zoning board, and it will be in the next issue of the uh, Cape Courier. But you 
if there's anybody interested in that, um, they could go to the website tomorrow and uh, fill out an application and, and those applications can begin coming in. Um, and the deadline for applying is March 26th. So um, don't wait until the courier. Get on the website. Okay. PaperElizabeth.com. Thank you. Um, the next item, item 114, is a request from Mr. Shields, Pond Cove gym teacher, for the use of uh, Fort Williams Park for Pond Cove Field Days, a wonderful event for any of you who have never participated. Um, and those would be, at his request, June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th and a rain date of June 7th from 9 in the morning till 11.15 in the afternoon. And if the 7th is uh, used because of inclement weather, the time would be essentially from 9 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon. And I'd entertain a motion at this time. I'll move that uh, we approve the proposed use of Fort Williams Park for the Pond Cove Field Day. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Okay. Madam Chairman. Um, Ladies, before you go. Sorry, Madam Chair, I wanted to um, see if I could make a motion, take an item out of order, yes. and add an additional item, which I guess would be called number 115. Um, and that item would uh, there, there is a 115. I'm sorry, 116. Thank you. Um, which would, and the motion would be to acknowledge receipt of the manager's budget, um, which the uh, <coughs> counselors have either already picked up or received this evening, and refer it to the finance committee for the budget season deliberation. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. That was the vote to suspend the rules. Oh, so now we need another vote. Move that we uh, receive and refer to the finance committee the municipal budget. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Trying to get us all home by midnight. Yeah. Um, I was going to say it's time for citizens items not on the agenda, but seeing only our fearless assistant town manager here in the audience, um, I think we will go to item 115, which is a request to enter executive session to discuss litigation, and in particular, Ramshead versus the town of Cape Elizabeth. Madam um, Chairman, just before we go into that, uh, yes. when we both collided, with the microphone there a minute ago. It was at the end of the discussion about Fort Williams Park and the uh, field day. I did want to mention for the council and for the public that uh, Family Fun Day, if it hasn't already been announced, will probably be coming before the council uh, in the near future for Saturday, June 19th. So I just wanted to get that on people's calendars, Saturday, June 19th for Family Fun Day at Fort Williams Park. Thank you. Thank you. So is there, a, um, just to explain to the public, we will go into executive session. We do not take action in executive session. We will go in for the purpose of discussing if any action is taken. We will come out of executive session. The cameras will not stay with us during that period, but we will come out of executive session um, for the purpose of taking any action uh, and or adjourning. And no, I wanted to explain all that before I, and no action is contemplated, I'm told by the town manager, so I guess it's only an update on litigation, so. Um, is there a motion to go into executive session? Second? Second. All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Thank you. Madam Chair, should we announce for the television audience that we're having a workshop on the 18th? and that we will be dealing mm -hmm. with the cell phone. Yes, well, I thought that they would have gotten it earlier, but, but I 
what I wanted to ask was, are there any other we, topics yes. scheduled? Yes, thank you. Um, there, there are at least two topics now scheduled for a council workshop on March 18, 7.30 in this building um, in the Jordan Conference Room. We will um, have a discussion of the Town Center traffic report, which the council received back in December. We've um, had no discussion of that traffic report, um, as well as cell phone towers and um, it looks like we will also probably have a special meeting to um, deal with um, approving the uh, contract for the school construction. So those are all things that um, will happen on March 18th. And with that, we will say good night and go into executive session. <laughs>